Good morning and welcome to the 22nd meeting in 2015 of the Finance Committee. Could I please remain everyone present to turn off mobile phones, tablets and other electronic devices. I'd like to welcome to the meeting and to the committee uh, our new member, Jackie Bailey, but unfortunately she's not here. Uh, we'll, we'll have to wait until she arrives uh, for her to declare her interest. Meantime, our first piece of business today is to decide whether to take item four in private. Are members agreed? Yes. Members have indicated their agreement. Our second item of business is to take evidence on the health tobacco, nicotine, etc. and care Scotland Bill's financial memorandum from the Scottish Government Bill team. I therefore like to welcome to the meeting Claire McDermott, Craig White and Dan Curran. Uh, members have received copies of the briefing notes and all written evidence submitted, so we'll go straight to questions. And the way we work in the committee is I'll start with some opening questions and I'll open it out to the rest of the committee. So suppose, um, um, in, in terms of the financial memorandum on, on, on paragraph uh, 10, you've suggested that health boards are expected to incur modest costs, and you talk about these being from uh, just over £10,000 to just over £41,000. I'm just wondering if you can tell me what assumptions these uh, figures were based on. So these were um, provided by um, Glasgow, uh, Greater Glasgow and Clyde NHS, and the enforcement provision that they, sorry, um, provision that they had put in place at one of their hospital sites um, to promote compliance with their own smoke-free grounds policy, which is an entire grounds policy. Okay, so that's at each site. So obviously, um, there are quite a number of sites across Scotland. How many sites are there across Scotland? So um, we estimate around 149, and that excludes um, mental health and um, specialist hospitals. Right. So that's so that's basically about 1.5 to 6 million pounds would be the range for that then. Okay. Thanks uh, very much for that. I don't really see that f upper figure in the in any of the in any of the, uh, the, the in the financial memorandum. I think. Um, that's probably on the, the, the 40,000, certainly, would be on the, the more expensive side. It was a large site that the, um, the, the estimates were taken from, from Glasgow, uh, Greater Glasgow and Clyde. Um, and um, Scottish Government provide um, funding to NHS boards to deliver the tobacco control strategy. Uh -huh. And that has been at 10.5 million per year. Um, that does include providing cessation support. Um, but it's difficult to disaggregate the figures um, in terms of additional cost to NHS boards since they all um, operate entire grounds policies at the moment and um, they all have different levels of provision in place for promoting compliance with those policies currently. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, now, um, it says here that in paragraph 11, the government is expected to incur costs in the region of £300,000 in relation to awareness raising of smoke free areas and hospital grounds. Um, and the financial memorandum states this is a subject to a fairly high degree of certainty um, based on recent campaigns. But in actual fact, uh, my own health board area, NHS Air Shanam, uh, have expressed doubts as to whether some was sufficient in comparison to previous high profile media campaigns. So, how does it actually compare in terms of the money spent on these? Um, yeah, I'm not sure where that confusion has come from. Um, we had actually contacted um, NHS Health Scotland, who had been involved in um, preparing that Green Curtain campaign for NHS smoke-free policies. Um, so the figure in the financial memorandum of 300,000 is actually based on that figure. OK, that's fine. Now, in terms of, um, again, uh, uh, if you look at what the, the submission of uh, NHS uh, Ayrshire and Arne is, they, they've also expressed concerns that because they've got bespoke signage already and you intend to do something nationally, that's going to impact on their, their existing um, ability to deliver smoking cessation services. Now, I, I take it, if they've got bespoke signage already, is there an intention to effectively replace that or would you be happy to allow them to retain it? Because the alternative, obviously, is that there will be a financial impact on the, on the health board. And lastly, on that topic, if you do decide that it's going to, they're going to have to have a national signage, would the Scottish Government pay for that? Uh, yeah, we've said we would meet the, the cost for the statutory signage. I mean, the approach that the NHS boards have as an entire grounds policy and what we are proposing as a perimeter around hospital buildings. And there would need to be statutory signage which made people aware that it was an offence um, within that area rather than a, you know, rather than a policy. 
Um, but we would see that as complementing the signage that they already have in place. I mean, the, the wording for the signage would be a matter for regulation. Uh -huh. um, but I think it would be possible to work with health boards to make sure that the signage aligns. So, for example, um, perhaps the statutory signage says that this is a, a smoke-free grounds, um, but it's an offence to smoke within a certain perimeter, and that would allow the two sets of signage to, to work together. OK. Now, now, part two of the bill is a duty of candour, and uh, the bill introduces a duty on organisations uh, providing uh, health and social care to ensure that when death or harm has resulted from an unintended or unexpected event, people are notified and apologies made and actions are taken to keep people informed of review of the events and further steps taken. Uh, what sort of events are we talking about here? Good morning. Um, I'll take that uh, question. Uh, the, the sorts of events that are likely to come within the scope of the duty of candour are unintended or unexpected incidents result, that result in death or significant harm. Um, significant harm in the uh, bill, which, as you know, is currently um, being scrutinised by the Health and Sport Committee, includes definitions such as uh, permanent lessening of bodily function or um, uh, changes in the structure of a person's body. So it would be very significant um, and serious levels of, of harm that result from um, systems and process failures in the health and social care system. Right. So negligence, in effect. Um, uh, ne negligence would be um, something that would be determined by a legal process. That right. the duty of candour procedure, as proposed, um, is a procedure that would be applied um, on the basis of the incident having occurred. Um, it, it may, in some cases, um, be an incident that's subject to future legal um, scrutiny and, and where there would be a claim made for negligence. But the duty of candour procedure itself is, is silent in relation to uh, determining uh, negligence. Right, OK. Thank you for that. I've got no further questions. Is there any colleagues um, uh, marked to be followed by John? Uh, yes, convener. It's around the uh, NVP uh, regulations. And I note that um, the FM estimates between one to one and a half million pound uh, regulation costs, but COSLI estimates are two million pounds. Um, do you want to comment on, on where, you, where you perceive the one, one to one and a half million pounds uh, is, is proportionate and, and perhaps where you would feel that COSLA are overestimating, if that's what you consider? Um, so we've not had yet had a breakdown from COSLA in terms of that um, £2 million figure, so we continue to work with them. It is, um, I think the, the financial memorandum highlights <coughs> it's quite difficult um, with the market evolving quite quickly. Um, so COSLA are working to, to break down those figures um, and what is making up that, that £2 million figure. Um, so we, we remain open. I mean, our figure is based, the £1 million to £1.5 million is based on the best um, data that we have available to us in terms of the number of additional retailers they would be expected to, to manage for enforcement purposes. Mm -hmm. um, but we continue to work with COSLA um, to assess their figures. So, so there, is, there is the possibility that because there would perhaps be overlap between existing tobacco retailers who then stock NVP, mm -hmm. um, that that would be uh, perhaps a, a, a double counting exercise rather than uh, new, new money that would be required because those premises would already be subject yes. to regulation. Uh, Glasgow ha, ha, have requested in their um, <coughs> submission that... Um, when the funding is allocated, that rather than it perhaps being subject to the traditional sort of funding formula, it looks more, um, more specifically at the number of premises that each local authority would be expected to cover. Um, is that something that Scottish Government are open to, um, or is that something that would need to be determined with COSLA? I think, I think it's something we could, could consider. We've not um, set exactly what the enforcement requirements would be because it might actually be a lower level of enforcement than is currently expected for tobacco, um, and that would be commensurate with the, le the sort of lower level of harm um, presented by MVPs. Um, I think I'm not... I, I think it would be a matter for the... Um, the local authority fund and distribution group to decide perhaps on how that that money um, is distributed to local authorities but it's certainly two approaches that we could put forward um, for consideration okay, okay by Jackie. Um, yeah I just think uh, a couple of points uh, I mean one to follow up what the convener was saying about this whole fact that the hospital grounds will effectively be split between one pit which has got a statutory regulation and the other part which has just got the local regulation is that correct 
Um, I mean, I think the suggestion is that that, is, that in itself, having that split, is costing extra money. And the suggestion from one place would be it would have been simpler just to have the whole area banned. C can you explain why that's not the case? Yeah, I mean, it was something we considered. When we consulted, we considered um, a number of approaches, including non-legislative um, measures to support NHS boards to enforce um, their smoke-free grounds policies, but in part considering what legislation would be appropriate. Um, we had to take into account the different sizes of hospital grounds across Scotland. So for some, it might be a very short distance to walk to get outside the grounds. Um, and for some, it could, be, it could be a matter of miles. Um, and we wanted to provide a proportionate, consistent approach across NHS boards. We think that a perimeter approach captures where the highest volume of traffic um, of people. So, you know, the ultimate aim is that people are not having to walk through clouds of smoke to get into hospital. Um, and that that provides an approach which, um, you know, captures where the main, the main traffic people are mm -hmm. around hospitals. I mean, hospitals I know are quite varied. I mean, if I take Glasgow, the Royal is almost like one building whereas Stob Hill is spread out over umpteen buildings. Yes. But you're happy that the costs are going to cover both of these situations? Yes. Right. OK. And, uh, I mean, the other area, again, the duty of candour. I, I mean, and I suppose I'm struggling to see what's new in here that shouldn't be happening already, um, and therefore why there's any extra costs. I mean, uh, it, it talks about unintended or unexpected events, but, I mean, is that not what the NHS does all the time? So you're right to highlight that um, some of the elements of the duty of candour procedure are part of good practice already, particularly within the NHS, though we know from work that's been undertaken that there um, still is variation, particularly in relation to uh, staff support, um, support for people affected by um, unintended um, events resulting in death or harm, and also training for staff. So the um, resources outlined in the financial memorandum as they relate to the NHS, um, have been focused mostly on the training and support elements of the duty of candour procedure. Um, in terms of um, disclosure and review and apology, there are some organisations that will come within the scope of the duty, um, which um, are perhaps smaller organisations or some uh, other health and social care providers um, who, who may not, um, either because of the um, frequency of these sorts of events being very rare, may, may not have uh, developed the uh, procedures and uh, approaches that uh, encapsulate all of the elements, the disclosure, the review, the training and support, which the, the, the bill outlines. Right, so I can understand that, that if it's people who, because if somebody's, a nurse is working in accident emergency, presumably either by our training or his training or by their experience, they will, they will be dealing with us all the time. Um, the, uh, even uh, front, frontline uh, nurses, medical and care staff who, who are dealing with um, the, the difficult and traumatic events, um, having to deal with um, an episode of unintended or unexpected death or significant permanent uh, physical injury is, is is not that common and, and some of the challenges that that presents to individual staff we, we know do require um, specific training and support. So, so yes, staff are dealing with day to day, but we are talking about the sorts of harm that results from systems and process failures that, that staff don't always feel confident to deal with. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> our next uh, person to ask questions is uh, Jackie Bailey, who I'd like to welcome to the meeting and to a uh, committee. Uh, it's her first uh, committee meeting as a full member, and she's replaced Malcolm Chisholm, who's a very diligent member of the committee. I'd like to invite Ms Bailey to declare any interest relevant to the remit of the committee. Um, nothing relevant to declare, but and I hope to be just as diligent as Malcolm Chisholm convener. Okay, well, well thank you. Um, <laughs> coming here on time would be a good start. <laughs> oh, oh, come um, on. Uh, allowing for traffic from the west coast of Scotland to here is sometimes a challenge. But the of convener course, I isn't look interested forward, in excuses. I look forward system. to the government improving the road network. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, trains indeed. 
OK, then, Jackie, questions from yourself? Thank you very much, convener. I'm really looking forward to being on this committee. Um, it, I think, can I concentrate on the duty of candour? Because the Scottish Public Services Ombudsman indicated that they thought there would be a rise in the number of complaints. Does it not follow that there is likely to be a rise in the num number of negligence claims, something the convener himself raised? And have you done any assessment as to what the value of these potentially could be? Um, in, in terms of the um, Ombudsman's suggestion that there may be a potential rise in complaints, um, the feedback and dialogue with, if we, if we take the NHS as an example, is often that when there have been these events and there's early disclosure, support, engagement and involvement of people affected um, and a commitment by the organisation to review and learn uh, from what has happened in a way that actively involves people affected, um, a lot of the time that doesn't then result in a complaint uh, being made because people are satisfied that the organisation are taking things seriously, keeping them involved and letting them know the outcome of a review. Um, and certainly that's reflected in, in consistently in feedback that, that we receive around some of the work and, and in handling adverse events. Um, that's also um, something that, that we've had feedback on in relation to negligence um, claims. Many people um, embark upon a legal process because there isn't dialogue uh, with the organisation. They're not getting answers to the questions that are keeping them awake at night. Um, and when spoken to, they, they will say, um, we don't want this to happen to, to someone else. And that's their primary motivating factor of, of engaging with the organisation. Um, there is some international evidence that when um, uh, health care systems implement um, new policies and procedures that support disclosure and apology uh, that claims can reduce um, and therefore um, th those are elements that we would expect to, to be a po positive impact to the duty of candor procedure um, though it's something that will be monitored uh, closely um, in the initial months and, and years of implementation in relation uh, to, to claims um, and complaints. On the basis of that monitoring, will there be flexibility to respond should claims increase? Um, in terms of uh, claims, uh, that would be um, something that the central, well, certainly in the NHS, the central legal office um, would have factored into their ongoing uh, planning that the d director of the central legal office um, has discussed with the policy team the, the possible impact um, of the duty of candour being implemented. So it's part of their planning assumptions um, and w there will be regular um, engagement and, and feedback around the, the early observations wh when um, and if uh, the procedure is implemented. There, there will be a need to consider other organisations. Perhaps I'm thinking of smaller organisations um, who are not likely to have claims that often, given the, the, the extreme nature of the events that come within the scope of the procedure. Um, but some of the training and support uh, resources that have been identified would be focused on helping those organisations to plan and think about the impact on the, the two issues that you've raised. Okay, thank you, convener. Okay, Gavin. Um, I want to ask about the of smoke-free areas and NHS grounds. I mean, does the government acknowledge that there's likely to be a short-term increase in the demand for enforcement? Yes. Um, so the Scottish government provide 2.5 million a year um, currently to local authorities to enforce um, smoke-free le smoke legislation, which has been in place um, since 2006. And that 2.5 million is um, on an annual basis. Um, the estimate of 149 hospitals, this is really extending the smoke free legislation um, modestly, um, I think. Um, but again, we've not had any um, breakdown of costs from COSLA around um, what that might be. So that's part of our discussions um, with them. Um, but we would probably consider that alongside the funding that they already, they already received to, to implement smoke free legislation. Okay. So the government view is that the, there could be a short-term increase. But do you have any? Does the government have an, a view on the, the likely size of that short-term increase, or do you just acknowledge that it's likely to be an increase? I think we remain open-minded at, at the moment. As I say, we've not had any indication yet 
um, on a national basis from COSLA, albeit they don't cover all local authorities, um, what, what that looks like um, in terms of a breakdown. So we'd be open-minded to considering um, what they put forward. So you're open-minded to, to funding it, at least in the short term, if mm -hmm. evidence is, is provided from yes. COSLA and or others? Yeah. OK, thank you. OK, thank you. Uh, there appear to be no further questions from the committee. I'm just wondering if there's any further points you would like to make before we um, wind up this session. OK, well, thank you very much for answering your questions uh, this morning. Thank you. Thank you. I'm now going to call a recess to 11 o'clock. Ten or other witness. Sorry, ten o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> I know that would that would get everyone excited. Uh, to enable our, our witnesses to um, be seated and give members a break. Ten o'clock.
Okay, I shall now reconvene the session. Our next item of business is to take evidence on the Higher Education Governance Scotland Bill's financial memorandum from University Scotland. And this uh, panel session will, all, will be followed by uh, a subsequent one from the Scottish Government's uh, Bill team. I'd like to welcome to the meeting Alistair Sim, Professor Anton Muscatelli and Gary Coutts. Members have received copies of all written evidence submitted along with a briefing note from the clerks. However, before we go to questions, uh, I would like to ask Mr Sim to make a brief opening statement. Thank you very much, Convener. Um, we have substantive and evidence reasons for being concerned about the prospect of ONS reclassification of universities as a result of this bill. These concerns arise from our consideration of the relevant ONS guidance on class reclassification and consideration of the bill alongside the accumulation of other controls on universities. We have reflected on the European System of Accounts 2010 and ONS and Treasury guidance on its application. In brief summary, our, our reasons for concern are as follows. Government powers over an institution's constitution are an indicator of control that the European system of accounts regards as defining whether an, an institution should be classified in the public sector. The bill expressly gives ministers the power to amend universities' constitutions by altering the composition of their governing bodies. It changes universities' constitutions by giving ministers the power to determine the selection method and term of office of the chair of the governing body. It also expressly gives ministers the power to change universities' constitutions by changing the membership of their internal academic regulatory body, the academic board or senate. Treasury guidance on sector classification is clear that this is a risk even if ministers do not themselves appoint the members of a governing body. The very wide powers given to ministers by section 20 of the bill to amend primary legislation affecting universities' governance and therefore their constitution are also a risk factor. Treasury guidance is explicit that even if powers to control an institution's strategy or constitution are not exercised, the fact of the existence of the controls is what will be taken into account in a reclassification decision. Governmental control of pay rates is regarded as an indicator of public sector status, and the bill expressly provides for this in relation to chairs of university governing bodies. The ONS, applying the European standards, will take a view on the overall level of control exerted by government on universities, applying the European system of accounts test of whether government is able to determine the general policy of institutions, as well as the specific indicators of control. The new powers proposed in the bill would have to be looked at alongside significant existing government controls and influence on universities' strategy and operations. Cumulatively, this creates a very significant risk of ONS reclassification. Controls apart from the bill, which should be taken into account, include detailed ministerial guidance on the priorities for use of public funding by the university sector, detailed outcome agreements between the Scottish Funding Council and individual institutions to give effect to this, which effectively determine institution strategy in relation to recruitment and teaching of publicly funded students, publicly funded engagement and industry, and public funding of research, adherence to the Higher Education Governance Code as a condition of public funding, and financial controls exercised through the Scottish Funding Council, and these include influence on pay through requiring institutions to have regard to public sector pay policy, the requirement for institutions to seek permission to borrow money above thresholds established by the Funding Council and requirements for Funding Council permission before granting security over land or property or offering guarantees or indemnities above certain thresholds. So Professor Muscatelli and Mr Coots can set out the impact which ONS reclassification would have on their institutions. All universities are concerned about this and its impact on entrepreneurial activities, business relationships, capacity to invest and capacity to attract philanthropic support. Um, we have had some discussion with Scottish Government, but I have to say, um, given the uncertainties, um, we, we, have, we, we have not been put in a position that um, gives us confidence that this issue has been properly investigated, and given the risks to the sector, uh, we really feel that, that, that university leaders need to have absolute certainty that the bill will not lead to universities' ONS reclassification. Thank you very much.
very much for that uh, opening statement. Uh, obviously, with the bill team uh, falling on from your own evidence session, a lot of your concerns that you've expressed will be put directly to the bill team. And I would hope that at the end of this morning we would have some uh, answers uh, uh, one way or the other. I mean, obviously, uh, in this session, we want to put some questions to yourself. I mean, it seems to be that uh, you know much of your concern, the overwhelming amount of your concern is on the issues that you've just raised with regard to the, uh, the, the, you, the re potential for reclassification. Can I ask what legal advice you've actually received on this? Or have you been in contact directly with the Office of National Statistics as an organisation? Uh, we have sought our own legal advice on this. Um, and our legal advisors have also uh, worked with colleges on ONS reclassification, reclassification, reclassification issues. Um, so they are really closely engaged with the issues. And the advice that we've had from our legal advisors is that the bill uh, when looked at in accumulation with existing uh, indicators of government control creates a significantly increased risk of ONS reclassification. Okay, and uh, my second part of the question was, have you been in touch with the Office of National Statistics directly? We have not been in touch with the Office of National Statistics directly, um, not least because we're trying to manage a risk here. I think if we um, were in touch with them directly, I, I have some concern that we'd actually catalyse the risk that we're trying to avoid. I think the very fact that this is, um, we're discussing this in a public domain, I think uh, they, it's not as if it's going to be a secret to them that this is obviously a, mm. a concern. I mean, the concerns that you've raised have actually been raised with us from a number of educational institutions, as you would imagine. So uh, I, I just find it a little bit odd you haven't uh, contacted them because I don't think it would be a bolt out of the blue. You know, it's like, oh, we weren't actually thinking of classifying them, reclassifying them, but now that the universities have actually contacted us directly, maybe we'll just do that. I don't, I, I can't, it's, to me, that seems a rather weak response. Well, I can see your point in that. I mean, I, you know, I have to say, I think the responsibility here lies with government to be able to actually give us the really firm assurance that this issue has been dealt with the proper due diligence. And at the moment, we simply don't have that assurance. I really feel that strongly. That's where the responsibility lies. Well, I can categorically assure you, you know, these questions will be put directly to the Scottish Government Bill team, and we will, we will not, um, we will not demit our responsibilities in this regard. Can yeah. we add to just a little bit? Yes, the, the, Office, the Office of National Statistics have, uh, in practice, over a wide range mm -hmm. of issues, made it clear that they'd make the determination once they have seen what uh, has actually happened on the ground. Mm -hmm. And actually giving advice in advance is not something that has happened. I think that's happened with the Aberdeen uh, Relief Road and other proposals that have taken place. It's very difficult. It, or it has proved very difficult to get definitive advice from them. And because they are completely independent, their analysis can uh, change. So uh, what might be available today might not be the case in, in, in the future. So it's not an organisation which people have had much success in getting uh, clarity of advice on what approach they will take until a decision has been made. If that's the case, what categoric assurances could the Scottish Government give you that it wouldn't impact on reclassification if, if you're saying that, you know, you can't find out whether an organisation is reclassified until think, after legislation has been passed? And I think that is exactly the risk that I'm highlighting, that I'm not sure that we would be able to get that sort of uh, guarantee. And the question, therefore, remains, is it worth the risk for what the Bill is trying to achieve to put it into, uh, to, to create that risk? Right, OK. Uh, now our, our job, obviously, is to look at the financial aspects, not necessarily the policy uh, objectives. Professor Muscatelli? Just to follow up on that point, which I, I think is a very important point, I think, uh, as Mr Sim highlighted, I think there's the sections of the bill which perhaps bring the greatest risks, which are around Section 8 and Section 20, and possibly on Section 13, which was mentioned, are actually not central to the review of higher education, which was seen as being implemented as part of government policy here. So to my mind, again, it's about minimising the risk and seeing whether we can improve the bill through, uh, through this dialogue. You, I think uh, Mr. Coots is absolutely right. There, is no there are no guarantees here, but it's whether uh, we can ensure that we do not uh, crystallise that risk. I mean, you say improve the bill. Do you want the bill to be improved or would you prefer the bill not to proceed to full stop? If you're asking me, convener... I'm um, asking you, yeah, as a yes. My, my view about this is that I don't think... I think there is, there is clear, there's a clear uh, mandate for this bill because not only the government but other stakeholders in, uh, in, in Parliament have said that it, there are issues that the bill should confront. From my point of view, I think there are different views across my stakeholders uh, as in the university, so I think we have to recognise that. And so... There are, but there are, you know, there are, there are things that can be improved. So that would be my personal position. 
Okay, uh, let's move on a wee bit, actually. I mean, you've obviously said that the government has provided no explanation of why it considers additional ministerial powers are uh, desirable, and then you go on to say um, the detailed assumptions contained in the financial memorandum were not the subject of consultation. What kind of discussions did you have with the Scottish Government specifically on the, these, uh, fi on the financial memorandum? Uh, on financial memorandum, absolutely none whatsoever. Um, the, um, the consultation um, on the legislative proposals um, asked in very general terms what, what costs and savings there might be, but um, on the specific figures. Um, that, that were presented in financial memorandum, they weren't, they, they weren't subject to consultation. You know, I think we could have helped to, to refine those, uh, so, so I regret that. Um, in terms of, um, if I may pick up on Anton's point about ways forward, um, I think the ministerial powers in this bill that are causing his concern also were not the subject of consultation. They weren't included in there. Now, the discussions that we've had with Scottish government officials, I think, lead us to think that they were trying to solve a technical problem um, of how do you change, uh, how, how, how do you enable continual evolution of the membership governing bodies um, in ways that don't require constant primary legislation. But I think what's happened is they, they, they have, uh, to some extent, inadvertently um, come into territory where they really have created this uh, risk of ONS reclassification. And I think we are very anxious to, to find a way forward um, that actually takes those ministerial powers um, out and reframes the way you can deal with these issues um, uh, because I just don't think the due diligence has been done on, on managing that risk. Okay, now, since the financial memorandum was published, have you had any discussions with the Scottish Government or its bill team since then? Uh, yes, we have. I mean, we, we have um, particularly, um, both orally and in writing, um, raised our concerns about the, the ONS reclassification issue. Um, and. Um, I would say at the moment we're, we're waiting for a substantive response to that. Right, OK, that's fine. I won't press that further than I was going to, but um, if you've not got a substantive response, I won't. Now, one of the other issues that have been raised by yourselves, and indeed, obviously, we'll, uh, me, uh, committee members may want to ask questions about other, from other submissions, simply because you're the kind of umbrella organisation. One of the things that has been raised is by a number of others, um, including yourselves, is uh, the possible loss of charitable status. Now, you haven't really mentioned that in your brief. Is that now because you accept that there wouldn't be a loss in charitable status? Because Oscar seemed to have, in their evidence to the lead committee, made it clear that, in their view, that wouldn't be an issue. Yeah, we, we obviously, we've reflected on, on, on Oscar's advice. I think um, Oscar's position in, in brief summary would be the bill in itself probably doesn't uh, lead to a risk of uh, reclassification for, for charitable purposes, um, but that um, if ministers used their powers um, to amend the membership of governing bodies or to amend the membership of academic boards or to um, make the very general changes to legislation that, that Section 20 allows them to do, that could lead to a situation where Oscar had to re-examine uh, whether universities were, were meeting a charitable test, the charity test in relation to, to ministerial direction. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm taking that um, really at, at face value. Uh, one thing Oscar do recognise, and I think this is... Um, pertinent to the ONS reclassification point um, is that uh, the bill does give ministers power to alter the constitution of universities and that mm -hmm. is one of the risk factors in relation to ONS reclassification. Okay, that's, that's an important point uh, um, you've made there. But what Oscar, what, what Oscar have said, and I quote, we do not see anything to prevent any conflicts of interest arising for charity trustees nominated under the provisions of the bill being dealt with in a way that enables the trustees to meet their duties. And we do not see that the provision for charity trustees to be nominated in terms of the bill will be incompatible with good practice. Mm -hmm. so I mean, in a sense, I'm, I'm taking that as face value. That, that, that's, that's their view. I think there are issues which, which, which will arise for people who have been nominated by interest groups um, onto governing bodies as to how do you um, reconcile your, your mandate from that interest group um, with, with the, your overall duty to the good governance of the institution and whether there are situations um, where you're actually going to have to absent yourself from the business because your mandate from the interest group may be different from your duty to the overall institution. I'm not saying that's unmanageable, but I think it will create difficulties for individuals in certain situations. Okay, thank you very much. I don't want to ex delve too much deeper into this because a lot of colleagues now want to ask questions. I'll just touch on one further point, which is um, you've said that as every member of the committee can confirm, university chairs are much more demanding than 
uh, portfolios that can be addressed in six days per annum. The time commitment is at least one day a week and in recent years has been greater than this. And you say, regrettably, it appears from the financial memorandum that the Scottish Government does not understand the significance of this role and the time required to fulfil it. So, in terms of the actual financial memorandum that was published, taking aside the ONS, etc., away from it, you obviously have significant concerns about that. What kind of financial impact do you think that this um, underestimation, as you put it, will have on the universities? Um, I think if you were to take the Scottish Government's um, model figure for um, remuneration per day, I think it shows a, a rate of £512 per day mm -hmm. as remuneration for chairs as their modelling figure, yes. um, and then apply that to a kind of median for the number of days a chair would be typically working on university business of, of about 40 days, um, you'd end up with um, a figure of around £368,000 expenditure on remunerating chairs across the sector. Mm -hmm. Now, I think our concern is not necessarily first and foremost with that amount of expenditure across the sector. I think our, our concern really is, again, on, on due diligence. Uh, if the developers of this bill conceive the chair's role as simply being chairing um, a, a meeting six times a year, then in, in our view they, they, have, they have failed to understand what the actual role of a chair of a governing body is. And, and, and obviously Mr Coots is uh, um, giving a, a significantly greater contribution than that to, to his role. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that obviously raises concerns about other aspects of the bill, if that is not understood, as you, as you suggest. I think there would also be an issue around the roles that other people on uh, courts would be playing as well. I mean, people who chair finance and general purposes committees or audit committees also have a significant responsibility. And as soon as you start paying uh, or remunerating uh, certain members that it brings in at a daily rate for the work that they're doing, then it brings into to, to question as to why other people who are also um, contributing a lot of their skill and time uh, and for very important functions of the, the, uh, the institutions not also be remunerated. It does look as though it's very much like the NDPB model of, of remuneration, which would be a big change for the sector. Um, and, of course, that would increase costs as well. OK, so in terms of the financial memorandum as published, taking away the ONS thing for the moment, um, uh, do you feel um, effectively in any way represents the financial impact of this legislation? Are you happy with some of it, not, not all of it, or are, are, are you not happy with any of it? My view is that the biggest risk financially, without a doubt, is the ONS one. I mean, the, yeah. the, the rest is really of an order of magnitude, which is more around, as has been pointed yeah. out, around how this is designed to make sure that the governing body is effective. And the, uh, Mr. Coots has pointed that the costs of membership are more like in line with what you would find on a health board or a non-departmental non public body would probably give you closer to an estimate of what it would be. But I think financially the biggest risk is without a doubt ONS because as I'm happy to outline, um, you know, that's how universities operate quite substantially on using their operating surpluses to make substantial capital commitments and that is the key area I think of concern. My, my, my real concern with the financial memorandum is, is it's you know, a concern that may be illustrative of the quality of thinking that's going into this work. Um, I mean, for instance, um, they're projecting a cost of £1,000 for the electoral process for a chair of court. Um, when I look at the evidence that's been submitted by universities that have run electoral processes, for instance, for um, alumni members of, of governing bodies, um, they're saying that to run a proper electoral process, you're, you're talking about £21,000 to £30,000. Um, and, you know, in a sense, it's not, the, as Anton says, it's, it's not the big money that's a concern. It's um, if the assumptions in this financial memorandum um, are, are so at variance with, with what institutions are seeing the actual costs um, would be, um, it just gives me concern about the quality of thinking that's gone into the issues behind this bill, including the ONS classification issue. Okay, well would also be a requirement to change our articles of association to, to meet the new terms. Um, and the last time that we did that, we got to consult with about 17 different organisations, all of whom yeah. have a view on our articles. We've got the legal fees associated. It's a huge complication, and it's the opportunity cost rather than the real cost, which is significant. A number of uh, pieces of evidence have suggested that, but I haven't asked you a question about that because I'm trying to leave some questions for <laughs> colleagues around the table who may wish I'm to explore sorry. some of these areas. Uh, the first one to ask questions will be uh, Gavin to be followed by Jackie. Good morning. Um, uh, Mr Sim, you said that you'd taken legal advice as University of Scotland. 
and with lawyers having looked at it and presumably examining Treasury guidance and uh, ONS publications and so on, if I heard you right, the, the legal view was that this bill would significantly increase the risk of reclassification by the ONS? That's correct. Okay. Um, in terms of dealing with the Scottish Government, I mean, obviously we can put questions to them, but um, you said you've had no substantive response, but um, when, when was it first formally, when was the ONS issue first formally raised with the Scottish Government, either in a meeting or in correspondence, from your um, knowledge? I, I raised this um, very shortly after the bill was published, I think in, in, in email correspondence with officials on the 17th of June, I said, look, this is a significant issue and we really need to be um, sure that you, you, you've bottomed this out. Um, and um, having not had assurances that that was the case, um, I then wrote um, to officials on the 13th of August, um, setting out a series of questions about the bill generally and the advice he'd taken on the bill and asking for a range of assurances. Um, and uh, we are, I, I, you know, I know they're working on it, but we, we've still to see um, a written response to that. Okay, so, but, so when I put questions to them, I can, I can say with, without any doubt, you raised it with them late June, mm -hmm. for example, at a meeting. But there was an well, and I raised it in, in late June in correspondence. I, I did also discuss it in a meeting in, in, in late June with them. Sure, okay. But you then wrote formally to officials on the 13th of August. Yes. And, and that letter hasn't had a formal yeah. reply. Not yet. Right, okay. In terms of what I haven't been able to find is, is anything in writing of, of what the Scottish Government's official view is. I mean, I, again, I will ask them, of course, but mm -hmm. is it clear to you what, what their official line on this is? Are they, are they saying there's something to review? Are they saying there's nothing to review? Is there any indication of, of what their broad line might be? Uh, I think the, the, the sort of conversations that we've had with Scottish Government officials have been, their, their initial line has been, well, um, we don't necessarily think there's a problem here because we're not taking direct ministerial control um, over appointments to governing body membership and we're not um, introducing new controls over borrowing, which is one of the factors that was considered in um, ONS's decisions on classification of further education colleges. Now, um, my response to that, as, as I tried to set out at the beginning of this session, is actually, if you look at the guidance and if you look at ONS practice, ONS looks much more widely at indicators of government control uh, over uh, strategy, uh, indicators of government control over a constitution um, of organisations. Um, and so um, my, my own view um, is that um, the due diligence hasn't, hasn't been fully done, that they've looked very narrowly um, at the issue, um, but that if, if they were to step back and actually consider the guidance and consider ONS's uh, practice, um, they would realise that they had to take a wider view of managing this risk. Okay. Let, let's say the legal advice you've uh, been given turns out to be correct. The bill passes uh, with no amendment and the ONS do reclassify. So let's just assume that happens, just for the, for the sake of argument. What, what would be, and I'm interested in, in all panellists here, if, if it were to happen and reclassification did occur, what would be the main consequences uh, for the sector and indeed for individual universities here today? I think um, in aggregate, obviously, we're concerned that... Um, institutions wouldn't be able to borrow money to invest, the institutions wouldn't be able to hold over reserves from one year to another so that they could actually invest in teaching and research, um, that we would lose um, philanthropic support because people don't really want to give their charitable donations to, to central government bodies. Um, but I think probably um, you know, both, both Professor Muscatelli and, and, and Mr. Coots have been considering the impact for their individual institutions and can really exemplify that in concrete detail. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, Professor Muscatel. Well, I'm happy to say, I mean, my own university is about to embark a very, a ma very major capital program, partly because we've, as some of you will know, we've just acqu recently acquired land. We've grown by about 20% in the last couple of years. And uh, our, we have a, a plan which our governing bodies approve, which will involve an investment of about 775 million over the next 10 years. So a significant capital program in terms of its positive economic impact on Glasgow and, and, and indeed Scotland. Now that has to be financed. It has to be financed from our operating surpluses. Uh, this year we ran, uh, we're probably going to be running a surplus of the order of uh, just over 20 million pounds. We have cash reserves which we've built up to try and uh, obviously do this, which will be of the order of about 145 million by the end of this financial year. And again, all these would not be used. We couldn't carry these over, as Mr. Sim has pointed out. The other area which is important is, of course, philanthropic income, because you need to fundraise. We have 
potentially plans to fundraise uh, about, about 110 million over a, a period of time to try and help fund this. And again, it's difficult to do that uh, without you know, being able to carry o over money. So these are the, those are the financial dimensions of the impact on an institution like Glasgow, but you can multiply it many times if you were to look at similarly sized institutions. We already have some practical experience of impact because our academic partners that, we, that deliver at GE for us are uh, for other education colleges, so they experienced reclassification over a year ago, um, and that has already had a significant impact on them. They cannot retain reserves from one year to the next, and any reserve that is created has to go into an arm's length foundation. Uh, that arm's length foundation is beyond their control, and while um, there is no experience directly as yet of uh, those arm's length foundations doing other than uh, 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 returning resources when required for building projects or whatever else to the institutions that generated them. There is no guarantee of that at all. Um, we're in the middle just now of looking at a procurement process for student residences and the finance companies that are looking at it are wanting to see the strength of our covenant. If our reserves are put into arm's length covenants and are off our balance sheet, then the cost of our borrowing is going to be significantly higher if we can borrow at all. Um, if we are wanting to develop uh, new courses and new partnerships with uh, uh, our communities and industry to develop what is required for the area that we serve, uh, we need to be able to take risks. Uh, if you don't have some reserves, your ability to take reserves when you're working on annualised funding is much, much reduced. Uh, and so I think that there are, are very, very significant issues if we're not able to operate in the way that uh, universities have traditionally operated. We've not had the same luxury of several hundred years worth of history as uh, Anton's organisation has, uh, but we want to be able to develop a relationship with our alumni, with the businesses in the Highlands and Islands, and develop uh, the sorts of reserves that will allow us to become the powerhouse that will develop uh, and support change within our region. And we are very concerned if we are classified as a public body, we will lose the opportunity to do that. Okay, thank you. I just want to ask you, Mr. Simmons, I mean, is, that, is that something University of Scotland could do then? I mean, I would certainly be very interested to see the, the potential aggregate impact um, where this happened. We've heard about Glasgow, we, we've, we've heard about, we've heard from Mr. Cooch as well, but it'd be quite interesting from my point of view just to, to look across the entire sector. If you ask each university, what, what is the likely cumulative impact uh, across the board uh, where, where it happened? I mean, obviously, there, there are two issues there. Um, is that something University of Scotland would, would be able to do, do you think? Yeah, and, and if I could just give you a sort of sense of that at the headline level, uh, I mean, we, at the moment, um, from the latest available figures, University's overall level of borrowing is around £530 million. Um, now, the consequences of taking it onto the public balance sheet are, are, are quite concerning. Um, I think the overall level of um, tax relief, well, I won't go into tax relief on because I think that, that's more linked to the charity point, um, but if you look at the overall levels of investment, capital investment that universities are putting in each year, it's in the order of around 377 million. Um, and again, um, if that's put at serious risk by our inability to borrow or by um, borrowing coming, in with, coming within uh, tight government uh, public spending controls, um, then our capacity to be doing that investment in, in providing the best possible facilities for students and the best possible facilities for research, um, are, are, you know, we are going to be severely hampered in that. Okay, thank you. Um, speaking on to charitable states, I mean, the convener asked, uh, asked a number of questions, but it's <coughs> a question that was sparked by his question, so I'm, I'm grateful uh, to him for that discussion, just to spark the question. If, if I read the Oscar advice correctly, it didn't refer at all to the ONS issue. It was looking at charitable status entirely in its own right. Um, now, that's just my reading of it. Obviously, Oscar could respond to that. My question would be this, and you may not know the answer. They looked at it in its own right, but just for the sake of argument, let's assume the ONS reclassification did occur. Presumably, charitable status falls overnight because you couldn't have charitable status for a central government organisation. I haven't actually looked into legally. I'm just wondering if, if you've looked into that. Just the question. I think it would require a separate legislation. I mean, essentially what happened to the colleges um, was they got brought into being classified as central government bodies with the, the impacts that, that Mr. Coots has described. But the government specifically legislated to say that even though they don't meet the normal charity test because they're under substantial ministerial direction, um, we are creating a specific legislative exception for the colleges. 
uh, so that they can retain charitable status. So, um, in my view, um, if if we 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 were ONS reclassified with, with the grave impacts that we've described on that, um, government would need to legislate if we were to retain charitable status. Okay. And last last issue then, or last area is just. Um, I mean, again, the question was was raised slightly earlier, but. Um, We've had some, we've had one witness uh, wrote to us and basically just said, kill the bill. Uh, but assuming, assuming that doesn't happen, are there, are there, and there are negotiations and discussions to happen and so on, but are, are there obvious things from your point of view that could be removed from the bill immediately that would, um, if not eliminate the risk, turn it into a, a minor yeah. risk instead of a, a significantly increased risk? Are there, are there specific clauses that could come out quite easily? Yeah, I think, I think particularly um, looking again at Section 8, which gives ministers the powers to change who's on the governing body of an institution, um, looking again at Section 13, which gives ministers the power to actually change the internal structure mm -hmm. of universities by changing who's on the academic yeah. board or senate, um, and looking at Section 20, which gives ministers an extraordinary wide power to amend primary legislation. I think, I think those are the ones that really re raise the critical risk factors. And they're also new ones. They weren't in the consultation on the legislative proposals. So um, I, I think there's creative scope for a rethink about how to do things around those sections that take ministers out of the equation. Okay, I'm grateful, thank you. Kavira, thank you. Thank you. Um, Jackie, to be followed by Joan. Um, I think you're right to be cautious about the application of ESA 10, um, given the government's infrastructure projects have been caught up in this as well. Um, I wonder whether I might tease out some of those financial aspects, because you talked in general terms, um, Mr. Sim, about £530 million pounds a year being borrowed by universities. Typically, what kind of projects are those, and what would a consequent delay in that money being available do to those projects? My colleagues talk about the impact on, on specific institutions, which will illustrate at a more concrete level. But um, typically, as, as you look across universities, what, what's being done with that borrowing? Well, we've got a great deal um, of estate that's not really fit for purpose. I think um, just under half of our estate is in what's called conditions C and D, where either it's in need of immediate replacement or it's, it's really falling apart, it seems, and we'll need that very soon. And often that's 1960s, 1970s estate that's also hideously carbon inefficient. So there's a lot of work going on to actually renew the estate, make it fit for purpose for students, make it fit for purpose in carbon reduction terms. Obviously on the research side, endlessly, um, as innovation goes forward, you need to make sure you've got the facilities and the equipment um, that are there to actually keep Scotland right at the cutting edge um, of research. And when you start falling back in that competition, um, it's hard work to to make up lost ground. Um, and also looking more widely um, at um, our economic impact, um, if we're going to be competitive and making sure that Scotland is a place that's attracting international talent, both at the student and academic level, we just need to be able to say, look, we've got the facilities that can compete with countries that have got much higher levels of investment. And uh, you know, that, that's hard work. I mean, if I could add, uh, one of the important things here is the economic leverage effect, because uh, one interesting thing is that if you go back, say, 10, 15 years, there were, of course, many more capital grants which were given through funding council, through other agencies. Because of spending cuts, they've, these have had to be uh, reduced. So actually, in many respects, we've been able to do things which we've be, has, has helped offset that because, you know, universities, as, as has been pointed out, are very major economic engines or, 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 uh, in, in the economy. And we are able to actually invest for the long term in a way that it's very difficult to do with, with public money because of the constraints on, on, on public budgets. Um, so it's a, it's a huge impact. And I'll just give an example of the sort of project that, that, uh, that Alistair mentioned. In preparation of our major infrastructure development, we're currently installing a combined heat and power system you know, across our campus in Glasgow. That's a 14, 16 million pound project. It will reduce our running costs of the order probably of two, three million a year in, in terms of energy costs. It'll reduce our carbon footprint by 20%. It's, uh, it's something which has had huge positive impact and has been well received. It, these are the sort of things that you know, are important, apart from the cutting edge research, which of course is hugely important 
with one you know, major quantum technology hub, uh, 29 million, that's required several million of investment to set that up, um, one of the four uh, quantum tech hubs in, in the UK. So these, are, these are the sort of projects you know, that, that are, can only be done over the long term. They can't be done on a short term basis year, year by year. The vast majority of our estate is owned by uh, our academic partners rather than by our, us directly. Um, and so um, we're in a very, very different position from, from the others. However, the issues are in relation to be able to make investment. We do want to provide uh, the, the, the absolute state-of-the-art uh, research facilities. We need to uh, increase the amount of research that's taking place in the Highlands and Islands. Um, and we are in the process just now of developing quite a lot of those facilities. But we're relying on people at Highlands and Islands Enterprise and direct grants to be able to do that in the future when we know that the public settlement is going to be tight and we want to be more self-sustaining ourselves. We want to develop these partnerships, develop capital reserves and be able to make those sorts of investments ourselves. We want to have exactly the same sort of opportunities as Glasgow and Edinburgh have had because of their history in the future. And uh, if we don't have the opportunity to maintain reserves, then that will be gone for us. I'm picking up from you a very direct impact on capital, but also an indirect impact on revenue too, mm. um, which would be equally concerning. Um, I, I noted that Mr. Coots earlier in, in an earlier answer said that actually ONS don't give advice in advance, but I understand the Scottish Government are currently in dialogue with ONS about new models for infrastructure projects, and therefore I would have thought that this is maybe something we should seek assurances that the Scottish Government are actually in dialogue about the implications of this um, for ESA 10. Could I ask, are you aware in, in, in seeking legal opinion, are you aware of any other European institutions, um, you know, universities, colleges, whatever, um, that, that have similar governance arrangements with their own countries that might point a way through the difficulties of ESA 10? Um, not in detail. I mean, I, if I could just answer that at a kind of aggregate level, I think one of the reasons why universities across Europe tend not to be doing as well as, as UK universities, for instance, in international league tables, is that quite often they are actually subject to quite a narrow range of controls by their, by their um, national or, or regional governments. In fact, quite often controls over whether you can acquire and dispose of property and, and controls over senior appointments. Um, Anton may know more than me, but I mean, for, we, it's not untypical um, for delegations to have been coming to University of Scotland um, to actually learn about how do we manage a system of autonomy that actually is both, both respectful of universities' contribution to the public good uh, while also creating that space of autonomy where we can act entrepreneurially um, in a way that, that, that is in the public interest. Um, so I think we are in a happier space than um, many European uh, partners and, and competitors um, in that, and, and they've certainly looked to the UK as an example of how do you carve out a kind of space of responsible autonomy where you have the entrepreneurial capacity to act in the public good. I mean, I certainly know that from, from Europe, where in some European countries, universities are very firmly in the public sector, um, these investments, these capital investments have to be carved out from public spending. And that's, you know, take a country like Italy, where a campus, if it has to be renovated, it needs to be central government, it has to budget for this within their, their public spend. I mean, if I can answer a different aspect of that question, when colleges were reclassified, they weren't just reclassified here, it also happened in England and Wales. And I gather that the Welsh legislation is interesting because they, they introduced elements which allowed greater student and staff representation on the governing bodies, but whilst staying, you know, allowing the, the colleges to be reclassified back into, into non-profit uh, independent organisations. So, you know, there are models there that could be looked at to avoid that level of control whilst at the same time exercising the concerns that stakeholders have about how, how, how governing bodies should be composed. And my final question, convener, is, I mean, it strikes me that nobody's asked ONS, unless the government have, for a view on this. Would that be something that you would regard as helpful? Um, well, I think if we are looking at from, uh, for assurances from government, we need to be uh, clear that they're reasoned assurances, and given that government can control ONS, I think that, that to my mind, um, would mean assurances that they'd agreed with ONS. Thank you, Convener. Okay, John, to be followed by Richard. 
Uh, thanks, Convener. I mean, really, to, to carry on that theme, uh, I saw in the Universities Scotland submission it says ONS programme already includes an intention to review the classification of higher education institutions. So, I mean, leaving aside this legislation, is there already a question on that point? Um, I think that comes back to what I said at the beginning about the, the, the accumulation of risk. I mean, I think if you look at the existing control regime, um, where you know, for instance, there are some controls over borrowing um, where we're working to quite a tight financial memorandum from the Funding Council um, and where we've got an outcome agreements framework where what's delivered by universities is actually quite clearly um, <coughs> a, a negotiation with a government agency. You know, you're, you're already in the territory um, where um, you're starting to look at ONS over your shoulder um, and, and when you add to that the risks that this bill poses, it, it, I think it puts you in, in a position that, that really gives you quite substantive worry. Um, I, mean, I think the ONS exercise that, that, that we described has is, is been stimulated by something different. It's been stimulated by, by how do you classify universities in England, given that they're increasingly reliant on, on, on fee income. But nonetheless, I think, you know, if you look at what's happened, for instance, with the way ONS looked at further education colleges, it was catalyzed by looking at six form colleges. Um, we can't be confident that, that they're going to approach that exercise narrowly, I think, uh, I think previous experience would indicate they wouldn't. I mean, I mean, could you put figures on that? I'm an accountant, so I quite like numbers. Uh, I mean, is the risk already 75% and this bill will take it up to 76? Or is the risk 50 and this will take it up to 75? I I mean, would, can you give any indication? Um, I, I probably um, find it more intuitively easy to put it in sort of red, amber, green terms. Okay. Um, I would say if you are looking at the impact of ONS reclassification, you'd put it very much at the top end of red risk. Um, I would say if you're looking at the likelihood of ONS reclassification, um, I would say it's kind of hovering on that amber to red border. Already? Yeah. Uh, well, no, no, with, with the bill. With right, the bill. I think, the, I think, I think without the bill? Without the bill, I would put it um, kind of lower amber, probably. Right, so we're moving around within amber, yeah. broadly. But but obviously, the impact would be up at red. I'm with you, right. Um, I mean, we've, we've had some touch on the financial uh, concerns already, and I just wanted to ask a little bit more about them. Um, because the fear obviously seems to be, well, there's a, there's a number of issues um, especially, again, from, um, I think this was from the University of Scotland, no, sorry, from the chair's paper. Um, the, the operating surpluses, I mean, the colleges have found a way around that, it appears. Um, and, I mean, I'm in a charity where there's a pair of charities and one of them holds funds and, and feeds in the main charity once in a while. So, I mean, that's quite a model that's quite kind of normal. That wouldn't be a serious problem, would it? problem. I think that it's, it's not necessarily a problem today and if you've got trustees on the charitable body that are completely in tune uh, with the, the, uh, the way that they were set up, but these will be established forever. The, the new charities, the, the Alps Lens Foundations have the powers to appoint their own trustees and over generations they will change uh, and I, I do fear that, and, and their, their powers are to support educational um, activity, not, with, not necessarily within the institutions that uh, 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 put the money into the, the, the ALF. There is no tie up there. And certainly if I was lending people money on the basis that they had these uh, uh, access to, to resources through the ALFs, I certainly wouldn't take that covenant as being particularly uh, strong. Is that um, a discussion you've had with banks or anything? Um, not directly myself, um, but we have had uh, we've had recent experience where um, the strength of our covenant in relation to the acquisition to the procurement of uh, the student residences that we're in the process of doing just now that the uh, that the ability of the university to hold reserves to uh, make sure that the revenue payments were uh, covered was absolutely essential to be able to do that and if that money was then held in an alf we would not be able to give them that assurance unless the separate trust made that commitment at the same time um they, they, they would be able to do that. I, I believe they might be able to do that, but yeah. that would not be guaranteed. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to get into too much detail. I'll just come back to you in a minute, Professor Muscatelli. But, I mean, I think my point is, I'm just asking if, if there might be ways around some of these things. And I, th 
I think there, there might be ways around it. They would not be as safe, they would not be as secure, they would not be as clear cut. And I suppose that, that my argument would be the same. Why increase the risk if it doesn't actually, uh, if it's not essential to achieve the, the purposes of the bill? Professor Masakata. <clears throat> Just on two points. I mean, at, at, at the moment, we fundraise through a trust, which is a, a, a separate charity, but it because there is control, it's consolidated into our account. So anything you create, which is a, has to be arm's length, otherwise you don't get around to your NS problem. From, from my point of view, and this is, I suppose, the point I made about improving the legislation, the, the declared intent of the legislation is to create transparency and accountability. I don't think taking reserves out of uh, an organization and putting it into another one which doesn't have that same transparency and accountability is a solution to that first problem if, if that is the problem we're trying to solve. And I think, I think to me that is the, the issue because if you start, for instance, putting um, lots of staff and student representatives onto the ALF, then arguably you could end up exercising control and then you consolidate it back into the, in, in, into the organization. So these are the, these are the complex issues that you generate by trying to actually create different structures. So yes, of course, there might be a solution. None of us, I don't think, have, have the full picture here, but it's about managing that risk, really. I mean, you've brought up something I was going to bring up later, and, and obviously this committee is looking at the finances, but you've mentioned specifically demo, a democratic accountability and transparency. And I think, I mean, one of my questions here is, are your concerns about the finances real concerns or are they a smokescreen because the universities do not want democracy and, and uh, transparency? Which seems to be the argument. I mean, the Today's Herald letter from uh, Dr. Ian Banks, UCU Glasgow president, uh, talking about the difficulty faced by staff and students wishing to influence a governance structure that is too often focused on business rather than education or research. So, I mean, that's the kind of counter argument mm -hmm. to all this. Mm -hmm. And, and, and it's pure, obviously, it's the Education Committee is going to look at the substance of that. But, you know, I suppose I, I'm, I'm trying to be convinced that you, you really have financial concerns and it's not just a smokescreen. Well, I can assure you personally, I have financial concerns. I can recognise that different stakeholders have different positions on this, absolutely. And that's why, you know, the bill has been published and has been brought forward. That's why my, I think on this issue, frankly, I think many of those stakeholders who have expressed concerns about transparency and accountability would actually agree with the point we're making because, well, let me take a, you know, let me take a particular example. Suppose an institution um, ends up running a deficit because of unexpected circumstances, say a, a cut in their research take. Clearly, you know, staff and students would like a smooth glide path to that, and it's something that we can provide through the fact that we have the ability to carry deficits forward to use our cash reserves. So, actually, on, on this point, I suspect, I mean, I can't guarantee, I obviously can't read in the mind of other stakeholders, but I suspect on, on this issue of, 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 uh, of the finances and ONS reclassification, there would actually be quite a lot of agreement across the sector. And again, just to reiterate, I, you know, this relates to sections of the bill which weren't in that original review in how, of higher education governance. Um, it's, it's additional parts of the bill which, I, quite honestly, I don't think any of us expected. I think this is a really, really important question. I, I, I honestly believe that if the financial uh, consequences of the bill were not there, we would be able to work with government and make sure that the issues that they've got addressed in the bill in relation to transparency and representation on university governing bodies, we would be able to uh, have a, a, a good discussion about that. We already moved a very long way in the introduction of the uh, Code of Good Governance for University Courts. That is already having a significant impact on the, the makeup of mm. uh, uh, the, the, the courts. It's not had its first review yet. We agreed with government that, that would be a review uh, to see how its impact was. It's not had its first formal review yet. And I believe there's an awful lot that we can do to make sure that we can meet those needs, uh, meet those demands to make sure that our institutions have evolved and are uh, fit for purpose uh, uh, today. But I also have to say that the sort of concerns that Mr. Banks and others have raised, I would ask, does the bill actually 
address those. And I think that you know, if, if we, we we're putting a huge amount of risk into our institutions because of the financial uh, consequences, but I don't believe that the other provisions within the bill actually either address the concerns that people have raised uh, uh, sufficiently to um, make sure that, we, uh, that they achieve what they want. And I think that what we do need is a bit better dialogue between government and ourselves to try and make sure that we can get institutions and governance arrangements fit for the future. I mean, very briefly, I would say the, 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 the problems that, that we we've raised with this committee um, are very real concerns. Um, I think the real concerns that are capable of creative resolution. I think if, if, if you look again at the powers in the bill that are given to ministers and, and look at uh, alternative ways of doing things, I think the, the ONS risk um, can be managed downwards. Um, and you know, I, I would just like to be confident that that will be the case. I mean, I, th I think that this committee has had issues with the ONS in, in totally separate spheres. So, I mean, I think there is a whole question in there that we probably need to look at separately. Uh, I take your point on that. But, I mean, you're not really arguing that the, the ministers control the universities by putting in a structure as to how the um, governing bodies be elected. Because, I mean, that would happen, happens in the commercial sector, happens all over the place. Government, I mean, theoretically, government can interfere in anything. So there's never, there's never f total freedom from the risk of government control, is there? There's a, I, mean, I think what, what I tried to argue at the beginning is, is, is you really do have to look at this in, in the round of accumulation of government controls. And obviously, um, we have quite an intensity of relationship with government in terms of specifying what our outputs are and being accountable for those outputs. Um, but when you um, look at ONS risk factors, um, and you look at ONS risk factors about that cumulative pattern of influence or control, and when you look at ONS risk factors specifically about whether government has <clears throat> the capacity to um, amend the constitution of an institution, um, you, you get into this territory where you do start to be seriously concerned um, that the risk of ONS classification has been heightened just simply by objectively looking at the guidance and considering the way that ONS has behaved in relation to other sectors. Okay, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Richard. To be followed by Mark. Thank you, convener. And Mr. Coots has spoken about the experience in the college sector of the restructuring there and its impact on financial uh, arrangements. I mean, is it fair to say, Mr. Coots, that not all of those issues which were of concern in the college sector have, in fact, um, been resolved uh, at this moment in time? And certainly, I've been made aware of some quite, I've seen quite technical details. Uh, which have had fundamental uh, issues and problems for, for colleges. For example, you know, if a college is running its own company on training, which colleges do now, and they're quite, these are multi-million pound businesses in some instances, then you know, whether they have their own insurance scheme, for example, they have to use a government insurance scheme, and that, and, you know, uh, that can have severe repercussions. And my understanding is that some of those issues have not yet been resolved. Uh, is that your experience, Mr. Coots, or, or do you think most of, the, m most of those um, questions have been settled? There are a number of workarounds being achieved, but with a huge amount of effort and a huge mm -hmm. amount of time being in, invested in looking at the way that we uh, manage that part of our business, rather than looking at what our primary purpose is and making sure that we're getting good quality education available for as wide a, 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 a group as, as possible. Um, certainly, if you look at uh, the, the University of the Highlands and Islands is the regional strategic body for the colleges that operate in our area. Um, and we're now in the position that if one of our institutions runs into a financial difficulty in year, um, then we would have to either keep a top slice from all of the institutions to be able to cover that during the year, which then means that you either have a surplus which goes into an alpha out and takes it away immediately from the, uh, the, the primary purpose of what you're, you're, you're there for, or uh, you, don't take, you don't take the top slice you give it to the, the colleges, and one of them could end up um, running a deficit, which they're not allowed to do. Um, and you know, so there are significant risks around the college sector, which I don't think we've actually fully experienced as yet, because it's very early days in, in, the, in the new regime. Um, and I do think that there, uh, I just think it would be crazy to risk to introduce that risk into the university sector if it, there is not an overwhelming value being added by the legislation that uh, would uh, uh, counteract that.
So from what you're describing, there's been an opportunity cost, as you put it, Absolutely. to the like sector, huge opportunity having to undertake cost. this work and create these new structures, which well, don't sound particularly efficient to me. Well, and, and additionally, you're saying that there are future risks or potential problems which have not yet transpired, but that are potentially there for the yeah. future. I can assure you that when the chairs of the individual colleges and their principals meet with us together, as we do regularly, we spend about 80% of our time looking at governance uh, and management issues, rather than looking at education, which is a real tragedy mm -hmm. and an awful lot of that is created by the complexity that has been introduced around ONS as well as other aspects. Mr. So can I ask you, the conveners obviously quite well in the point, we'll have the chance ourselves to speak to the, the bill team around the, their negotiations, discussions or lack of them with ONS but I mean a number of members have raised the issue over what's happened in terms of the review of the, the capital uh, programme and its uh, reclassification as a result of the uh, European account system uh, ruling and, uh, you know, uh, the ONS's findings after that. I mean, I mean, it seems to me this shows there is not a laissez-faire approach from no. either a European or ONS level on these matters. Yeah. Uh, and you know, do you have any information, therefore, as in given the light of that you know, very problematic experience of the Scottish Government and with real impacts on capital funding arrangements, has there been any... Um, uh, uh, any work undertaken by the Scottish Government uh, or any uh, reconsideration of this issue in the light of that experience? Is that something that you're, you're aware of that's been taken into consideration or is, has there been a, a lack of dialogue again from the Scottish Government on that uh, issue? I mean, I'm not aware of reconsideration of the issue, but I think um, that certainly what's happened with the, the, the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route has, in our minds, heightened the risk. I mean, as you say, you're seeing quite an activist ONS um, that really is taking a close look at whether things are, are tipping over between um, private and, and public sector classification. Also, roughly at the same time, you've seen um, ONS taking a very close interest in housing associations in, in England, not on the basis that ministers were taking direct power to um, appoint members of, of, of housing association boards, but on the basis that ministers um, are exerting influence over hus housing associations by, um, by, by making a, a policy priority that they dispose of their stock. So in my mind, um, the risks around ONS issues um, have, you know, have been heightened by recent ONS um, decisions. Um, and, and, you know, I, I just personally don't feel confident that um, this bill has been considered properly in the context of, of what are really are quite heightened risks. So you would hope that heightened risk has been taken into consideration uh, or you expect it should be so, but you've got no reassurance from the Scottish Government that they actually have. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, to, to be fair to people I talk about in the Scottish Government, they will say that they've reached their view on ONS issues, but I, I simply think given, given, the, uh, given the, the necessity to take a wide view on the guidance um, and on ONS practice, I, I, th I, I simply think they've not opened up that view wide enough um, to actually take a holistic view of the risks that, that this poses. Uh, final question for me, convener. Why were these issues not foreseen in terms of the, uh, the, the process that was undertaken in terms of the review, during that review process? I mean, was it an issue simply that th th these issues w were not expected to be problematic, they weren't anticipated? Or was it that you believe that the, the review th it saw that its uh, objectives, its intentions could be achieved without creating this I, kind I think, of uh, uh, problem? I think the latter. I mean, I think, um, you know, wh wh whether one is, is, is fully in accord with what was recommended in, in Ferdinand von Prinzinski's degree or not, it didn't really conceive that government would be taking extensive new powers over universities. It was much more about a kind of internal reform mm -hmm. of university governance. So I think the idea um, that ministers would take powers uh, that could enable them by regulation to alter the composition of governing bodies or academic boards um, is, is, is something that doesn't sit comfortably uh, with Ferdinand's review. And if you look at um, Ferdinand's own evidence to the Education Committee, um, you know, while, while he's obviously supportive of the broad principles of what the bill is trying to achieve, um, even he is expressing concern about the means by which this bill is setting out to achieve them, uh, with particular regard to the new powers that are given to ministers. So even the chair of the review himself has concerns over the, the impact of this bill and the way it's being pursued. Yes. That's very helpful to know. Thank you, Thank you, Martin. Jean? <clears throat> Thank you, Camino. Just a, a few areas I want to, to ask some questions on. The first is around, um, it was yourself, Mr. Simmer, who said that uh, the costs around the appointment of a chair you felt had been uh, significantly underestimated. 
um, and you used the comparison of election of alumni members mm -hmm. to the court. Um, I note in the financial memorandum that it says, uh, although costs will depend upon the nature and size of the electorate, uh, considers that the maximum cost of this election would be broadly equivalent to the cost of electing a rector within the ancient universities. Now, I don't get to vote on who the rector is at Aberdeen University, but I do get to vote on who the alumni members of the court are because mm. the vote is carried out across all the alumni. So uh, you're surely not suggesting that the appointment of the chair, the electorate for that would be thrown open to the alumni of the university, such as myself, who don't really have much of an interest in who chairs the, you know, the court or the university, which I graduated from over a decade ago. Uh, no, but I think uh, I mean, I'll let Anton talk about costs of, of, of rector election, but um, I think um, essentially to have a proper due process, you know, and, and this, is, this is, for instance, has been managed through Electoral Reform Society, um, so that you've got a proper due process, um, and you would need a proper due process if you were to have election by students and staff, that's still, you know, a, a, a wide constituency, um, and there's um, also um, other categories of elected members specified in, in, in Section 4 of the bill. So, I mean, you know, we're just seeing the evidenced experience of it's not gonna, institutions it's not, running. It's not, it's not going to touch the cost of an alumni election, though. Um, I, I don't. I think it depends how it's organised. I think if you're going to do it properly, you, you, you have to actually get um, it professionally organised, and I, I think it's got a cost. I mean, you know, we're, we're talking about. I'm just citing what what, it, what institutions have have said, and those costs of twenty-one to thirty thousand, you know at least give you a ballpark it's, it, uh, it's you know, far removed from a projection of a thousand pounds that's that's in table one of the financial memorandum. Professor Muscatelli, have you anything to add? I'm, fr I'm afraid I don't have uh, estimates at, at, at hand. I, I think with electronic voting methods if the constituency were to be staff and students there would be larger setup costs. I wouldn't imagine the running costs would be particularly high because you could probably f you know, you know, most of us have very effective HR systems that allow us to know exactly who would be on the electoral roll. So I, I think it would, there, would, there would be set of costs which would probably be in the ballpark of, of five-figure sums. But after that, you would, you presumably be able to run them quite, uh, quite effectively. I don't think that's that, that's the significant cost, really. Okay. There, there was a point made about the. Um, the difficulties that would be faced by those members who were from a nominating body uh, and the potential uh, f for them to represent that nominating body as, as members uh, of, the, of the court or of the board. Um, that happens already for many people who are appointed to charitable trusts and boards already. I mean, I served as, a, as an appointed member from Aberdeen City Council on a number of charities where, you know, the, there are very explicit rules around, you know, which hat you're wearing uh, when you're sat around the table. So presumably that's not going to change as a result of this legislation. I think what you say about explicit rules, but what hat you're wearing is actually really, really important and um, certainly something that, that we would want to clarify during the passage of this bill. Um, I think there is a difference um, between being what, what already exists across many institutions, which is being a trade unionist elected by the staff. Um, uh, who serves on the governing body and understanding that, that your role there is as a governing body member with the corporate responsibility for the good governance of the institution. I think it's interesting between that, which I think is quite proper, um, and the possibility that um, you're there in a sense like a 1970s public corporation where you, uh, you are there because you have a mandate to pursue from your, your, your interest group and, you, and, and, and that's, that's your only role on the board. So I think as this bill goes through, um, certainly what I would be wanting to see is absolute clarity that if you are on the governing body um, because you've been nominated by an interest group, that your responsibility is, as you've described it, it's the responsibility to the good governance and strategy of the institution, not a responsibility to the constituency that nominated you. Okay. Um, I just want to interrogate this point around the reclassification a little bit further. Um, and uh, with, with forbearance, I may, this might take a little bit of time for, for me to quote the relevant sections. Um, you, you know, I note in the University of Scotland submission that they state the heightened risk comes from power to decide how long people should become chairs, power to decide how long people should serve as chairs, power to determine remuneration of chairs, power to determine composition of institutions governing bodies, power to determine internal structure of institutions. Now, the Oscar submission, um, while, as Gavin Brown says, does not reference 
ONS reclassification does nonetheless interrogate each of these areas in turn. It says on appointment of the chairing member, does not give ministers the power of appointment or removal of a chairing member. Moreover, regulations cannot be made without consultation with the older university involved. On remuneration payable, it says our view is that this would not in itself amount to an ability for ministers to exert control in a way that is central to the activities of the higher education institution. Again, ministers must consult with the older university involved before making regulations. On composition of the governing body, it says, these sections do not give ministers the power to appoint or nominate members to the governing body. This power lies with the various nominating bodies. Nor do they give Scottish ministers the power to remove members of the governing body. In our view, therefore, they do not give ministers any power to control the higher education institution's activities. And on composition of the academic board, they say these sections do not give ministers the power to appoint members to the academic board, nor do they give Scottish ministers the power to remove members of the academic board. In our view, therefore, they do not give ministers any power to control the higher, institution, uh, higher educational institutions' activities. So on each of these points, which ONS will give cognizance to, Oscar have given due cognizance and have concluded that they do not amount to ministerial control. So presumably ONS would be looking at that through the same lens. And ONS will be looking at it through, through a different lens. O ONS will be looking at it through the lens of the European system of accounts um, and the various guidance that exists on the interpretation of the European system of accounts. And certainly if I look at the Treasury's guidance um, on the interpretation of the European system of accounts, it's absolutely explicit that power to change the constitution of a body um, is an indicator of ministerial control. And as I set out at the beginning of this session, ministers are expressly taking the power to change the constitution of bodies. So we are definitely in a position of heightened risk of ONS reclassification, especially when you look at it with accumulation of existing controls that could be taken into account by ONS as indicators of government control. So the current, the current regulations or, or rules as they apply to universities in terms of composition, constitution, etc. Were they a, a result of statute? Um, there's a difference between being a result of statute and being a result of ministerial decision. I mean, Parliament has, at various stages um, over the centuries, um, taken powers to um, make its own, le make, make legislation about the composition of university governing bodies. The ability of Parliament to do that isn't something that would lead you to ONS reclassification. But what this bill does, which has not been done before in Scotland, is to give ministers the power directly to change who is on a university's governing body um, or to change who is a member of its inter or, or the balance of membership of its, of its internal structures, particularly the academic board. So this is, um, in our mind, a marked departure from what Parliament has previously thought it appropriate for ministers to do. So, so if, hypothetically, if that were to be uh, <clears throat> that that could only happen through further primary legislation, that would give you comfort and the uh, bill could remain as it stands? That, that, would, that would be a different matter, yes. Okay. Eugene? Yeah, um, thank you for all the information so far. It's been really interesting. I just have one very simple question on the back of all of that. Why do you think that this bill is uh, in place or is being proposed? What do you think the government want to see changed as a result of it? Um, well, I think that one can debate the merits of the bill, but I think the government has, got, uh, has expressed an intention at various stages that there were elements of the recommendations that have on Pranjinsky review um, that, in the government's view, could not simply be taken forward by um, the sector's own action, but actually required legislation to, 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 to make it happen. Um, and I think that, you know, the, the, the merits of that obviously will be debated uh, through, through the bill's parliamentary process. So I can see, you know, I can understand the intention, but I think the issues that we're, we're dealing with um, with this committee are, in a sense, unintended impacts of that intention uh, and unintended impacts which we think really need to be intelligently managed. I, mean, I, I would agree with that. I mean, the central intent of the bill would not be modified which is, if it is to apply the von Brzezinski review of higher education, would not be modified by addressing the issue of Section 8 and Section 20, because that goes beyond that original review. It's about potential future changes. With coming back to the earlier question, which I think if that were to be done by primary legislation, 
and did not affect, did not introduce control, would be less of a risk uh, than doing it through regulation? I think for very, very understandable reasons. There's been an awful lot of pressure uh, applied by uh, staff and students around representation on courts and to uh, ensure that they have a proper engagement. We're looking at institutions that you know, have been ongoing for a, a hundreds of years and they need to evolve and I think there are, that uh, a commitment to uh, ensure that, that those constituencies have a voice uh, on the governing bodies is something which um, that there's been a lot of pressure for. I think that there is a commitment made to legislate for that, which I don't think there is actually a requirement to make. Um, so I think that we're seeing a bill which is to meet uh, pressure from particular constituents um, rather than to, for, the, for the purposes that is stated. We can achieve what the, con the concerns of trade unions and uh, staff members and students in other ways in continuing to evolve the, the code of uh, good practice. I think that's where we should go. So do you think then that it's a matter of trust? That, um, or do you think that the government have been pushed to this? I mean, there was demonstrations out here from students and trade unions, and the universities didn't seem to react to that. So is it fair that they would try and, and react to that? I think universities have reacted to it. I think the code of governance has gone an awful long way. If you look at the representation on our courts, if you look at the uh, expansion of the, the, the uh, people that sit on our courts, it has changed a lot. Uh, I would welcome having a full review of the way that the, the code has impacted on the way that the effectiveness of our courts, uh, and that is scheduled. Uh, unfortunately, this bill has actually preventing us progressing with uh, that review, and it would certainly, in my view, be sensible to have that review uh, that we can uh, take full account of um, before, before we make a judgment as to whether legislation is required to make it go further. Um, but I, from my personal perspective, I believe that we can achieve the intentions of government around the representation on courts without the need for legislation, which carries a huge amount of risk, um, which could be very detrimental to the sector. It's also a very diverse sector, and you'll, have, you'll appreciate this. If you were to look at the governing bodies across the piece, you will see very different structures. So if I were to tell you that in my governing body, the governing body of my institution, we have six representatives of the academic staff, two staff representatives who are elected, who are invariably trade union representatives, well, trade union members who put forward with trade unions because they will have the electorate that can, can, can get them elected. We have two student represent, representatives and we have a rector who currently is, is not attending meetings but who may, uh, may attend meetings if he or she wishes. It's a very different structure from another institution and I think, I think this is the issue is how can this diversity be managed in a sensible way to meet the aspirations of other stakeholders, which has already been mentioned by staff, students and trade unions, in a sensible way which allows good governance to be exercised. That to me is the, is, is the problem which this bill is trying to solve. And, and I think if we could do that in a sensible way, as has been pointed out, um, I think we will we'll be in a good place. But I, I'm more worried, sorry, about the financial consequences in the context of this committee's obviously interests. Yeah. Supplementary. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Mr. Coots there appeared to indicate that the, the legislation in and of itself to, uh, to amend the governing structures gave him concern. It seemed from Mr. Sims' response to myself earlier that it was the power of regulation or the, the ability for secondary legislation to make amendments following that legislation that was the, the more pressing point of concern. I just want to get to the nub of this. Is it the, the view uh, across the panel that there should be no legislation in relation to the composition of, of these bodies, or is it simply the fact that that legislation could be amended by secondary legislation that is the problem? Levels of concern. I mean, one is the concern about financial impact, um, and I think the concern about financial impact is the one that we've described. That if, if, if the Scottish Government looks again at the ministerial powers and takes out ministers' power um, to amend the constitution of governing bodies um, and ministers' power by regulation to um, amend the composition of academic boards, then that, to, m to my mind, is, is likely to, to, to manage the, the ONS risk back down. That, that, that's a sort of specific issue that we've been dealing with in, in this committee. Um, I think it's obviously a wider issue of, of, of genuine debate as, as to whether um, this legislation has, in fact, um, been necessary. 
um, given that the sector has already introduced a higher education governance code, given that every institution has got um, robust representation of students and staff um, already um, on the governing body. I think that, that, you know, that, that is a moot point that will be debated as this, as this bill goes through the Parliament. That has concluded questions from the committee. Are there any final points you want to make before we wind up the session? Okay, well, thank you very much for responding to your questions. I'm going to call a five minute recess, uh, well, to 11.20, give members a chance for a natural break and to uh, replace their witnesses.
We will now continue our consideration of the Higher Education Governance Scotland Bill's financial memorandum and take evidence from the Scottish Government Bill team. I therefore like to welcome to the committee Laura Duffy, uh, Kerry Twyman and Stephen White. Uh, I offer the Bill team the courtesy of a brief statement as one had, had been asked for by our previous witnesses previous witnesses that's been declined so we will go straight to questions from the committee and of course the opening questions will be from myself and then I'll open up the session to colleagues around the table and first thing I would want to say is that as convener of this committee um, seen dozens of financial memoranda over the years but I have to say it's the first time 90 percent of the discussion has been on what is not in the financial memorandum itself and that's obviously something uh, you're aware of from this morning's deliberations so let's get straight uh, uh, to it, basically. Um, I'm just wondering what due diligence was undertaken uh, in terms of putting together a financial memorandum to take into account the, the concern which has taken up most of the evidence we received this morning in relation to the potential impact of the uh, Office of National Statistics uh, in relation to this bill. Well, the consideration of risk attached to reclassification of Scottish universities by ONS um, wasn't a feature that we, we um, considered would be in the financial memorandum, but I'll, I'll walk back from that to when it was first considered as a substantial risk. So it's not a risk that would appear in the memorandum because we had analysed it very carefully for well, literally a number of years. I think back 18 months when the bill was in its genesis in terms of uh, looking at what had come out of the 2012 Review of Higher Education Governance, uh, chaired by Professor von Prundinsky, uh, we started to look at what the Code of Conduct had achieved and what was uh, the recommendations in that report, which had might form the, the basis of the bill. And the issue of reclassification was factored into all of that thinking. Thorough analysis of the European System of Accounts 2010 guidance on the indicators of control and I mean, the summation of, of that work with dialogue across government was that the indicators of control were the, the bill, its, its final plan content would be compliant with those indicators of control. Therefore, to go back to my initial point, is why the financial memorandum doesn't feature analysis of that. Okay. Could you pull your mic a wee bit forward? It's just because you're quite quiet. And it's just to make sure that we can we can all hear you effectively. Now, obviously, uh, what, one of the things that's been that's come out of this morning's evidence, and, and there's in the written evidence which you'll be well aware from University of Scotland, is they said uh, basically they're asking have uh, it would be ill-advised for the government to press ahead with the proposed legislation without having first obtained a categorical assurance from the ONS that the new ministerial powers will not lead to universities being reclassified as central government. Has that taken place and have you had legal, legal advice on that? I think it would be my interpretation that the ONS won't give categorical analysis or, mm -hmm. or, or, or sum, summation statements on the plans of this government or any government. Um, they will look at what a government has legislated for or provided for when it's in front of them and they will make their judgment. I mean, they're an active organisation. They mm -hmm. take an interest in many areas of public policy and finance. Uh, but no, there's no um, point at which there's been a discussion where they have um, assessed and cleared, if you like, uh, any content of the bill. That's not, in, in essence, as I understand it, the way they work. Often Treasury will encourage um, governments uh, across the UK to, to, to have dialogue with them prior to that. Yes, I mean, I mean, to be fair, what you've actually said this morning was what came out of the evidence session this morning as well. It's almost like it has to wait until the dust is settled before you can actually see whether or not ONS will then have an impact. But what uh, Mr Coots, who's sitting behind you, said actually in evidence, and I said this morning, said this morning was it would therefore be, and I quote, crazy to take the risk of actually going ahead in terms of financial aspects uh, under these circumstances. What's your response to that? What I can say is that there's been a thorough consideration of the risk with the emphasis squarely on the indicators of control. I've r removed them from a folder and I wouldn't read them all. I think there are eight principal indicators of a control set out in the European guidance. And if you just pick the first one, it talks about an indicator of control being the rights to appoint, veto or remove key personnel. The bill is about the how, not the who. It's about process. It's not about people. Um, nothing in this bill it requires higher education institutions to ask ministers for permission for anything. And also I think it's important that 
There's been a lot of discussion of the secondary legislative powers, and, and I think you know, we've seen loud and clear what people have said today, but also the written evidence is there's a lot of it, and it's very compelling, and, and, and we'll look at all that. But, but the secondary legislation, I suppose, in essence, was an attempt to future-proof the bill in order that you don't need primary legislation to, to do something again when modification would, would be a good alternative. And it's not about um, ministerial control. There have been some assertions that it'd be, it, almost ministers may, may find themselves on uh, governing bodies. There's absolutely no intention on the government's part to do that or have any direct involvement control on appointments. Again, it's about process. Um, and that type of direct um, appointment and, and veto and so on, removal of, of personnel, runs through most of the first two or three of the indicators of control. It then goes on to talk about ownership of voting interests, uh, rights to control through contractual agreements and so on, control uh, in, in other, in other uh, areas. So there's been a thorough examination of the, these indicators of control, both the Treasury extrapolation of the European guidance and the uh, European guidance itself. And, and the conclusion of the Scottish Government is that uh, the risk proposed by the bill does not advance beyond any risk that existed uh, prior to that, which came out in, in the previous session as well. Okay. Uh, that, Kerry has, sorry, yeah, Kerry wants sure. to make just to go back a little bit about, I guess, whilst we have not been able to approach ONS directly on this, because that isn't the way it works, just to give a little bit more coverage, I think, around finance's relationship with ONS, probably over the last 9, 10, 11 months, um, in light of the, the ongoing capital issues which have been raised, um, we... we are very cognizant of reclassification issues across the board. It's something we're very aware of. It's a risk that was highlighted very, very early on in this process. Um, we have been developing very close relationships with ONS because of the capital discussions, but wider because there is a recognition that the Scottish Government needs to have wider skills and knowledge around ONS classification. And on the back of that, we've actually had a workshop um, done a few weeks ago with ONS going through all of these indicators and the various scenarios that would lead you to trigger an indicator. And whilst we didn't specifically talk about universities, Stephen and I both attended that workshop and asked questions um, that were specifically about this, this bill um, without putting that in, into specifics because ONS don't like to answer specifics. And we did probe that further. And ONS are actually coming back tomorrow for another series of meetings with finance professionals and various policy areas, again, teasing out these very issues so that we have that understanding. So whilst they can't, we can't go to them with a scenario and get a direct answer. This is the more roundabout way in which they've been extremely helpful and given us a lot of time to give us these kind of assurances which allow us to make these risk assessments. Because I think effectively what we're being asked as is to do a risk assessment of there being an ONS re reclassification trigger if, and, and I think, I, I guess the point is, are we to stop a wider potential benefit because of a risk, or are we to do that assessment, define that risk as low, and proceed with something that we think provides greater benefit? And that's the scenario here. We've decided that there's a low risk, that if there is a risk, it's around factors that are already present in universities, and that nothing that's being done here, in our belief, raises that risk to a higher level. May I add, if, if it if it even needs to be said that there's absolutely no intention on the government's part that reclassification would be an outcome, mm. something they would seek actively to avoid. We wouldn't want that as an outcome. I think that's probably understood, but just in case it needed to be said. Yeah, I think to be fair, I think it, we, everyone understood that, but I, I, I think it helps for you to say that as well. I think that's, that's positive. Uh, so in your view, is this uh, reclassification issue a red herring? I mean, it's not for, for officials to... to, to Agree, agree or not with, with that proposition, but um, we've assessed risk very carefully, and not just recently, over a long term backwards. Um, we've had dialogue with ONS and universities in this realm before that as well. As I say, it's an active, it's not just shot up recently. So um, we would always take seriously anything any stakeholder partner says and look at the evidence to this committee and the evidence to the Education and Culture Committee. But on balance, the view of the Scottish Government is that no additional risk is proposed by this bill and that its uh, provisions are compliant with the ESA, European System of Accounts, indicators of control.
Okay, now you talked about a number of discussions, but what has come out of uh, a lot of the evidence here is that uh, there's a feeling that uh, stakeholders in terms of universities were not actively consulted in terms of the financial aspects of this. Uh, numerous um, is, uh, um, submissions have said the same thing, and I'll just quote University Scotland, which based on the Committee of Scottish Chairs, I should say, which says, the detailed assumptions contained in the financial memorandum were not the subject of consultation. And University Scotland said the consultation document contains no detail on financial assumptions. Now, further to that, uh, we heard this morning that there was a meeting with the chairs in June, and they wrote on the 13th of August to the Scottish Government, and have not received a response, uh, despite over a month having elapsed. Uh, so I wonder if you can talk about that, and do you not think it would have been a, a positive thing to have responded prior to this meeting to, to that letter in writing, to not least to... to um, to advise the committee? Well, we, we have noted that we got the letter and we said we would assemble the response as quickly as possible. It is quite a substantial piece of correspondence running to you know, a number of items mm -hmm. uh, which were complex and significantly serious issues are posed to the government. So we've got a variety of colleagues making sure we get the correct answers back. So I, I can guarantee that a response will be returned to University of Scotland. But uh, as I say, and I, th I think colleagues would, would, would probably concur from University of Scotland that it was a substantial uh, memo to us. But of course we will. If it had been prior to today, that would have been absolutely ideal, but we're still working through the range of issues. If I could, mm -hmm. on, on, on the financial memorandum, um, I think there's been quite a lot of emphasis on the secondary legislation mm -hmm. elements and almost their financial impact linked to the overall re reclassification risk. Um, I think that the opinions and views shared through the evidence will be taken into consideration in looking at the way they are currently framed. I think that would be open to government to do that, um, particularly a, a, the benefit of sitting at the back and hearing the evidence from, from colleagues earlier. Um, the, uh, probably expressed in a new way uh, uh, t to me than in prior dialogue, but the idea that risk could be addressed by looking at the content of those or the, or the presence of those at all, that's something we'll take particular note of. Now, there was a point that consultation was not had on those items, these sections. Um, I think I said earlier, the views of colleagues were, were slightly surprising in the sense that they were largely intended as future proofing and, and what some of the sections have, and maybe in another bill, would have passed off without as much comment, but I can see the clear concerns and views of many who have, uh, have submitted evidence. So uh, there was no intention, and, and certainly no intention, there's been certain commentary about ministerial control. Again, I think I said before, the idea of a minister sitting, or, or a direct appointee of ministers sitting on any university governance structure is just not the objective at all. Okay. Now, well, let's look at some of the issues on the actual published memorandum itself. You know, um, you know, you've talked about discussions with partners and stakeholders for whom there may be modest financial implications to be absorbed within existing budgets. Um, taking on board the, the kind of a view expressed that there hasn't been the, as, as much discussions as possible uh, as it possibly could be. Um, you've also went on to say there's no information readily available to calculate staff costs associated with recruitment of a chair. And uh, you went on to say uh, it's also anticipated governing bodies will meet an average between four and six times in a, uh, an academic year. Now, as you probably, well, you will be aware, um, this has been, these have been hotly disputed, actually, particularly uh, uh, there appears to be some concerns that uh, the bill doesn't seriously really take into account what the true costs would be. Um, for example, um, you know, the University of Edinburgh has said that the bill is drafted would involve significant compliance costs for a university estimated at £79,500 a one-off cost and up to £125,000 a year in annual recurring costs. And it's been said by witnesses this morning that the financial memorandum doesn't seem to express any real understanding of what the role of a governing chair would be and that, that their role is much more substantive than that. So I'm just wondering if you can comment on those issues. Yeah, well, I'll probably start with the, the, the central one first and the central criticism. Um, in looking at the remuneration issue for elected chairs, there would be elected chairs if the bill was enacted, um, we were examining the core of that job. I mean, the, the job's different in different HEIs and... Um, you know, many days have been cited, 30 days, 50 days, 25 days, and so on. 
So we're looking at the core of that job so as not to overstretch the coverage of what would be statutory remuneration. And I should say by remuneration, it would be allowances. It's not salary, it's not wages, yeah. it's not pay. Mm -hmm. But I think given what the evidence has presented and what colleagues have said earlier, I think it's, it's fair enough to say that perhaps that was pared back in its focus um, a little too much. And I think that it would be our job to look at all the evidence and revisit some of those assumptions, particularly on the days spent by a chair doing their job. I think we, 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 would, we would concede that. Okay. Now, in, in the issue of elections, uh, the University of Dundee said that uh, a recent election at the University of Dundee for the post of graduates assessor on court, which outsourced to the electoral reform site, cost £21,000. But you're basically suggesting that it would only cost £1,000, the election of um, a chair um, with a minimum of two candidates, uh, you know, um, I, th I think that's only a partial estimation. I, I think maybe Laura will be able to amplify this, but that is around the expenses for the candidates. I think that the financial memorandum from Wright concedes that because the franchise for the election is not yet clarified, it's difficult to estimate exactly how much the election would cost. And obviously there's lots of different ways to hold an election with a range of costs. I would also... Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, Laura. Uh, what I would also say is that a lot of these expenses are, and this is a general point, they're already incurred by institutions. So I suppose what was particularly difficult in, in compiling the financial memorandum was the net additional cost over a, and above what's already spent on items like this. But sorry, Laura, I interrupted. The cost of the election would very much depend. The cost of the election would very, be very dependent on the franchise. If you had a franchise that was simply the governing body, the cost would be almost negligible. If the franchise went beyond the institution, um, I think something that was discussed earlier was if it, uh, it included alumni, you would have an electorate that was vastly greater than if it was um, kept to staff and students. And so, as Stephen indicated, it was very difficult within a financial memorandum, one, to quantify exactly what that would be with... Um, the bill as introduced including regulation making power and it's very difficult to separate out those additional costs for different institutions but in terms of kind of general general um, look at how it might be done um, there are electronic based systems which can be purchased which have a limited cost that will that will cover numbers that sit around staff and students that wouldn't incur excessive costs. Okay. And I think I'd also add to that that the estimations of costs are, are about compliance with the bill. Mm -hmm. Extending uh, practice beyond legal compliance could result in lots of different costs depending on what you... I mean, for example, um, if a newspaper was to be used for an advert, um, you might use one newspaper and comply with the legal... Uh, obligation in the bill, another institution may decide to use four or five. The costs could be different um, depending on the approach you take, which won't always be, there could be a, a lesser, you know, lesser scope could comply with the bill. It's not, uh, it's not that there's a tariff of, of different approaches. But as I would say that the, the, the financial memorandum's estimates aren't about underestimating anything or, or, or giving an impression that there are no costs. There was a central challenge in the additional costs and the evidence that's been gathered by, by committee and by you know, the, 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 the submissions to the, to the Education and Culture Committee will inform uh, additional work on the financial memorandum. Okay, now I'm just going to open up the session to colleagues around the table in a wee second, but I mean, looking at the financial memorandum and the concerns that have been raised about the lack of consultation on it, given, obviously, you may not, um, at least initially, have, uh, have um, considered the ONS thing to be as big an issue as it's become, if you were to redraft this financial memorandum, say, was there anything else you think would, should be in it that's not already in it? Um, well, I'm, I'm given my own opinion, uh, based on all of the work to date, that um, the financial memorandum would not warrant inclusion of uh, a treatment of the hypothetical cost of a risk. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not an exact science, but that's, if you're asking me now today, that would be my summation today. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, okay, the first uh, colleague to ask questions will be Jackie, to be followed by Gavin. Thank you very much, convener. Um, when were you aware of ESA 10 and its impact on classification? Well, 
I mean, myself and predecessors in higher education division would always have been aware that it was a determinant of classification of universities, but in partic in, particularly in this project, um, it was, I suppose, if you start off from 2012 when the review published, chaired by Professor Von Prindinsky, and that became consideration of whether it would be legislation, and then there was a code of conduct for a period after that. So there would always have been knowledge that reclassification was an issue. In earnest, it was looked at um, in great detail after the, the consultation on the bill ended in January 2015, and then in the period where through cabinet consideration and so on, it was looked at across government in detail. So in answer to your question, knowledge of its determinant role you know, is, is there all the time, but specific reference to it in detail after the consultation closed and we were looking at all the views. Yeah, I think that's helpful clarification because the Scottish Government certainly didn't think there was a problem until, you know, they came up against uh, reclassification for their infrastructure project. So I would have been interested to know that, that, that you had some inside knowledge that the rest didn't. Um, can I ask, at that point in January 2015, who did you talk to? Um, who have you taken advice from um, about reclassification? Well, can I, can I well, you okay, Kerry? Sure. Can I just jump in? You, you mentioned around the capital classification. To be honest, our, our, our thoughts about this would have actually um, come before that. They would have been on the back of the college reclassification. And as we've alluded to earlier, when the college reclassification was initially being looked at, which was actually back in 11-12, universities were considered in, in the round in those discussions. So in many respects, the issue of college and university reclassification was, was already on the table long before really the Aberdeen um, bypass problems were being looked at. So I wouldn't have said that it followed after that reclassification. It, would, it, was, it was always something that we were aware of um, following on from the discussions around colleges. That, that's what I was trying to impress is that it's, a, it's an evident piece of the way we work. You know, it's, it's always been there in universities, but when we were looking specifically at this bill, given the consultation on this bill, that was the point when you go through cabinet process, you look in detail. Because as well, the consultations items aren't exactly the same items in the bill. So it needed looked at specifically then because two of the items in the consultation weren't taken forward at all. So once we had the final short list, if you like, then that analysis was conducted in detail. Within government, to answer a question I think you asked as well, what's well, the full range of, of, of interest across government, finance, legal, policy and so on? So it's internal advice, you haven't sought any no. external advice and all the advice therefore has been you know, within government? On this bill and its compliance with ESA 2010, and to go back to something I said earlier, it's, it's not conventional that governments um, would, would approach ONS on a regular basis to, to sense check things at their inception. I mean, I think perhaps from you're referring to dialogue on, on, on other infrastructural points which are later down the line, but on this bill looked at on a case-by-case -case basis, the period of intense examination of its compliance was the first half of this year after the January consultation ended. Okay. Um, I hear, you know, obviously we've heard today about the exchange of letters, although I think University of Scotland are waiting for a response. If you've been looking at this in detail since January, surely you're in a position to respond to the kind of detailed letter you receive from University of yeah. Scotland. Well, on the ONS in particular, and I, if, I, if, I, if I paraphrase it wrongly, I think in the letter that they sent us, uh, which, which, which does run to to half a dozen pages, they're looking for a categoric guarantee that ONS wouldn't seek to reclassify. That's only something ONS can do. So on that point, oddly, at that point would probably be easier to dispatch a quick answer. Some of the other very detailed questions about the, the underpinning legal detail and other parts of the bill which are making us have to go through it with obviously with great care so that the answers are correct. But on the ONS point, only ONS can reclassify. We, they will not give a categoric binary answer on provisions in any bill until they see how it finally is enacted. But it is the case that the Scottish Government will consult ONS, not for a definitive view, because they won't give you that, um, but for advice as you have been doing through the workshops, which seem to have only taken place recently. 
Dr. Kerry. Yeah, I mean, the workshop that took place in the middle of August um, took a long time to schedule. Obviously, the, the person that gave the workshop is the key ONS individual who provides advice to the committee who makes decisions. So his time is extremely limited. And it was we actually began talking to them in May or June about setting this up and decided to keep it until after the summer holidays, which is why we went with mid-August. Um, but I, I think the point is reclassification risk is on our radar um, when we are looking at, at, at all policy decisions, legislative, things of this nature, when we are looking at risks in the round, um, financial, policy, stakeholder, reclassification is very firmly on that radar and is one of the things we are looking at. It, it's become normal course of business over the last few years. There's been no specific tailored dialogue with ONS on the Higher Education Governance Bill. Um, because in the case-by-case -case basis take on this, um, our deep analysis of the indicators of control suggested that it didn't present a risk which would warrant that. I don't know, I'm not involved in the work on the infrastructure side, but whatever the dialogue consists of, I, I, I expect it's a result of a process which has gone before that and it's reached that point. So all risk assessment in this area is different. They're not all the same, the same assessment. We, with, with due respect, when you're talking about a risk assessment that's based on how ESA 10 is applied, then given it's the same piece of statute that flows from that, I would have thought there would be a heightened risk or at least a heightened awareness amongst the Scottish Government about the potential risks of ESA 10 and therefore yeah. early engagement with ONS for advice would have been yeah. something I thought you would have done yeah. as I, good practice. I, I think we're not making ourselves clear. The, the way yeah. ONS works is yeah. they don't have a facility for you to go to them for advice early on. Um, they, they are, in the workshop this came out, they are extremely busy. The, the formal channels don't work that way. I think if we were to go to them with a request around a bit of legis legislation of this nature, um, I, I can hypothetically, I, I, we, we know what the answer would be. What we did do was use our skills and experience and, and the knowledge within the Scottish Government to assess these risks and then as I said we, we used our wider understanding based on discussions with ONS around other reclassification to build into that assessment. I'm keen to answer your question as fully as possible obviously and I think that there are, two, there are two different assessments of risk here. I mean, again, my knowledge of the infrastructure side, I'm not involved in that, but I'd imagine there's very specific points of yes or no, you can or you can't do things. What's been assessed here by stakeholders who have a different view to government's view is the, it's almost a, a less direct risk issue because it's about, well, what would it mean if there was a process set in train that the chair of court was, um, was put in place a certain way or the, the composition of the governing body? It's not the same as a, a very detailed point of a financial instrument or, 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 a, or a structure or a model. So they are different. Um, but what I would like to reinforce is, that, that is the thorough look at risk and that government take the risk issues proposed by stakeholders very, very seriously. There's no blasé uh, approach to this. We've looked at it in detail and it is a considered opinion that the risk, uh, does, uh, that, that there is compliance with the indicators of government control and that is our summation at the current, yeah. at the current time. Uh, and, and also, as I think we, we've, we've tried to make clear, we've deemed that to be low risk. However, if as a result of a wider ONS review of universities, there was any risk of reclassification. Ministers have also made it clear that that is not a policy goal, so we would then work to, to ensure that universities were not reclassified and take what measures that took. And obviously the precedent for that is what happened with the college reclassification down south in England and Wales, where ONS permitted them to review um, the control mechanisms to ensure that they remained out with the boundary. So I think we need to make that very clear. On the one hand, we did a full risk assessment, looking at ESA 10, using our knowledge and discussions with ONS, and deemed there to be a very low risk that what was contained in this bill would lead ONS to come and look at universities and reclassify, but we also were very aware that if that was to happen, and I, I stress we deem that to be an extremely low risk, we would then move to do whatever it took to ensure that universities remained outside that boundary. And I think in the middle of that, that, that you know, strategic t take on it, that um, there's some profitable ground for dialogue between government and partners on the content of the secondary legislative provisions. I think that's been reinforced again and again. And, and, and colleagues said that the bill 
um, would benefit from that and, and, it, and it would address issues of risk um, rather than a call for the bill not to be uh, uh, taken forward at all. So I thought we, we particularly took note of what colleagues said on that point. And Thank finally, you. convener, I think, I think that's very helpful and I appreciate the reassurance that ministers don't intend this. Um, I don't think anybody around this table has called for the bill to be scrapped, but I do think you know, that listening mood and hearing what amendments could be made, certainly I think I would encourage. Um, because you have done this on the basis of an internal risk assessment without any external advice, um, and there is an opportunity cost if it is reclassified, that I don't think would be appreciated by government or by universities themselves. So in this thorough risk assessment that you talk about, have you also assessed that opportunity cost if capital is counted against public borrowing, which it may indeed be if the classification goes against you? Well, I, mean, I suppose the short answer to that was, was no, is no because of the risk assessment led us not to do that work in the financial memorandum. However, what we do have, of course, is all the figures put before us by our colleagues in the higher education sector who have shared in evidence their view of those opportunity costs, which we will examine very thoroughly. Thank you. Sorry, but just what, what you're saying is, though, that if, if reclassification did actually happen, even though you think it's extremely unlikely, you'd be looking again at the bill's provisions to reverse some of the provisions in the bill to ensure that, that it wasn't reclassified? No, I, th I think all I'm saying is that I, I can't fail to have taken note of what colleagues have said today and, 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 and highlighted that a, a dialogue and modification of some of the provisions might help risk rather than a removal of the bill, which has been some of the material that's been in the media and the press and so on. So I think it's all, all I'm really saying is that we look at what evidence has been given and uh, within government and advise ministers on what that might mean, how it links to risk. I mean, the figures, I'm not giving figures credence that have been uh, by saying that. It's just that we have at our disposal these figures. We can review them, whether they're accurate or, or not, or whether we would agree with them. Uh, we have them to look at, but it doesn't change our essential summation that the risk is, it's, it's not just very low, we, we don't think there's a risk of, compli of, of a problem with compliance with the indicators of control and it doesn't advance any current risk in, in any substantive way at all. But, but I think in, in going back to the original question, we are very aware of what the implications of reclassification of universities would mean. I work extremely closely with colleges. I am almost every day on the phone with FDs and SFC. We, we, we are very aware of the long process colleges have gone through, which is by no means at an end. It has been difficult, and, and we are aware of the size of universities, the size of their reserves, the amount of borrowing, the capital project. We've been doing a lot of work with them on their 10-year capital planning. So very aware. I couldn't give you figures right Right now, but very aware of the extent of, of the financial implications that reclassification would mean, and, and that is something we would absolutely want to avoid. Uh, from Stephen there, because I understood from your previous answers to Jackie that you were basically saying that we don't think reclassification would happen, but if it did happen, we'd be, we'd be willing to look at it again to take that out. But, that, but when I asked that, Stephen, he kind of said no. So I, I just want you to clarify this key aspect. If reclassification, for whatever reason, I know you're saying it's low risk and you don't think it's a, a likelihood, but if it did actually happen, would there, therefore it, would the Scottish Government then act to change provisions to ensure that it didn't subsequently, it wasn't subsequently implemented. I think my, my, my opinion would be that the Scottish Government wouldn't want to do anything which would, would, would hasten reclassification, but we don't think that's a risk. I think Kerry's only trying to make everyone aware that we take the, the issue extremely seriously and that that outcome would not be desired. The, the secondary legislative powers, colleagues believe, because they've said that a discussion about them and potential modification may lower risk, I suppose what I'm saying is the government don't think effectively risk needs to be lowered, but if it helps build consensus and improve dialogue and relationships, then government would look at that. But the reclassification event, should it, should it happen, which we, as I say, don't think it, it would, it wouldn't happen during the bill's passage. No, the bill would sure. need to become an act and then there'd be a long process of pouring through every element of it by ONS, and that is entirely uh, theoretical. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. Okay, um, Gavin, to be followed by Richard. Start with ONS. You basically said ONS are pretty busy. Um, this isn't the way it works. Uh, they don't have a facility to give you a binding decision. Um, in some of them, ha has the Scottish Government written to the ONS and said, can you give us some guidance, some advice, some thoughts on this potential bill? No, because 
because there, there, there is not a process to write to the ONS and ask for their advice on, on work that we're undertaking. The way the ONS works is that they decide to review a body for reclassification. So what will happen is if a new body is coming into existence or as the result of a merger, we will write to ONS and Treasury to let them know that this new body is being formed and our view on what its public status will be. So that's when a new body is coming into existence. However, for a situation like this where it's, it's a piece of legislation, there is no trigger activity um, that a new body is being formed that requires a reclassification and there is no mechanism to go to ONS. It would be ONS's decision. They would write to us and say, we have decided because of this piece of legislation to undertake a review of the status of universities. And they would, at that point, they would come to us to discuss the issue. Okay. I, 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 take, I, I accept there's a convention and there might not be a trigger mechanism and so on, but uh, simply ask, so wh why have you not just written to them? To, uh, give it, given that we got burned over capital projects, and we're keen to avoid that experience. Uh, I simply ask, they might write back and say, yeah, we're not going to tell you anything, but what I do find surprised is that the fact you haven't written to them and simply asked the question. Well, that's tied up with their analysis of risk. There was no uh, requirement to write to them. Um, and also I would say that this heightening of the view of risk is relatively recent. Uh, in terms of its coverage in the media and so on, uh, on this bill specifically, because the provisions in this bill are all inspired by, or informed and inspired by what was in the review from 2012, and then refined in the consultation which ran from late 2014 to 2015. Much of what was in that consultation is intact and in this bill. It's only in recent weeks that the, the reclassification risk by ONS has been very, very heavily covered in media and in dialogue. Now, that doesn't mean I'm diminishing its importance, but uh, this bill's content wasn't just uh, devised in the recent past. These concepts have been around for, for years and ONS wasn't cited. On ONS specifically, what, what they, my understanding is they won't do is you write to them and they'll say yes or no. Um, they, like, in fact, I think they actually gave a response to the Scotsman. The Scotsman in the article about the financial impact of, of, of reclassification, which was at the end of August, their opinion was sought, and I think, paraphrasing roughly, it said, um, we take note of this development, but we wouldn't give an opinion until we'd looked in detail at the, at the, at the provisions and, and their outcome and so on. So that was then drawn in the press in a very limited way. I do, I do understand that they will, um, perhaps through Treasury, uh, have something of a, of a policy dialogue on request, but that would never lead to any kind of determination. I mean, in some way, to give you the authorising environment to proceed with, 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 because ultimately they need to, at the start of a process, for example, things can change. You can have plans in a consultation, two, two of the proposals go, there's four left, so it's a movable picture. So they like to see the settled picture, I think, as the convener said, they like to see the end point. Okay. I won't dwell on this issue other, other than to say, in, in my humble opinion, I think it would be worth the Scottish Government writing to the ONS formally and just asking, can you tell us something? You can't give us a full binding opinion. Can you tell us something so that we don't get burned? I'll, I'll leave it at that point simply there. Say that, we'll that's that. my opinion. Um, right, listening to your evidence today, you've covered a full risk assessment. You've done a thorough consideration of the risk. You've done it over a long-term period. Uh, you've done a thorough analysis of the European system of accounts um, and so on over a period of years and specifically since January. A, a phenomenal amount of work uh, by the sound of it. In the interest of transparency, can this committee please see some of that work? That's an issue we probably need to provide ministers with advice on, depending on what form the work's in and so on. And, and yeah, I mean, it's certainly something that we can go away and consider and, and that direct request. Of course we can. But we'll, we'll, we'll work through what that collection is, what that work uh, is in its constituent parts and, and get a reply to the oh, committee. Okay. But I, would, I would ask you to go further than you can go to, but I request then, can you ask the, the Cabinet Secretary formally, can this committee have access to this very detailed analysis? Because it would yeah. furnish the debate and I think it would help. Well, you've made the also, request. You've, you've made, made the request, request and it's okay. recorded. Thank you. Um, it wasn't in the financial memorandum, um, uh, and you pointed that out. It also doesn't appear to be in the business and regulatory impact assessment. Can you explain why it didn't appear in that document? I think roughly for the same reasons it didn't appear in the financial memorandum, our assessment of risk, um, the summation of that was that it didn't warrant inclusion in that document. 
either. Okay. Um, in terms of, so you've done all this analysis, I mean, Jackie really put the question to you about what external advice you've taken and you, and you said you hadn't taken formal advice from the ONS. Have you taken any other external advice? Have you taken legal advice, for example? Have you spoken to experts in the field, as it were? Or, or has, it, has it only been internal discussions with no the No external uh, liaison on this issue. Okay. You've it's a sensitive asked. issue as well, oh, because okay. I think, you know, the, 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 the idea that we would have a, a wide consultation on that issue alone, you know, when, when, when the issues were being unpacked in great detail internally. So, no, we, we didn't uh, have or conduct external discussion and take expert advice from out with government. It, 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 of course, it's a sensitive issue, I accept that, but I, I just want to be clear that, that your, advice, your decision, that which you've reached categorically and, and stated with some strength, um, is that there's no risk at all here. But just to be clear, you, you well, haven't... I think we've said there's low risk. We've, we okay, haven't sorry. ever said no, there's no, no risk. Sorry, no, no additional risk is what you, is what you said. No, it it no doesn't go beyond the current risk at all. Is no what additional, you additional risk to that okay. risk already identified. Okay. I mean, there is a, 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 an acceptance within this field that there are certain facets of the structure of the university governance, world and financial arrangements, legal and so on, that there, there exists a, a modicum of risk. Modicum is a word I would choose. But this bill's provisions do not advance that, okay, that right. existing base of risk. Okay, so it's not no risk. I, I, I didn't mean to say that. But no no additional risk is, is what you said, and mm. that you did quite rightly say that was low risk overall. Um, but, but you've reached that view, and yet you did express it with some strength. But just to be clear, you haven't taken any advice from any external source on this? No. No. Okay. All right. Um, and you're absolutely, I'm not misquoting then by saying it. it it doesn't go beyond the current risk at all, not a millimetre, not a fraction. Our assessment is that any current level of risk is not advanced by the provisions in this bill. Sure. It's set against an analysis of the ESA 2010 system of accounts. Okay. All right. And just taking on then one, one final point, and I think, I, mean, I think you've answered this in part already, but let, let's assume you're wrong. Okay. Let's assume, like AWPR, uh, the Scottish Government got it wrong, or got it differently from the ONS, okay, let's not call it getting it wrong, but a different view which would have consequences, which, because certainly the Scottish Government in advance of that didn't seem to think that it was a risk uh, and didn't seem to think it was going to happen. So we have, we have been bitten here before, which is why I think the committee is, is taking this so seriously. Um, um, but if, if it does happen, and if reclassification does occur, I mean, have you done any work at all on the financial consequences? I mean, you heard what universities had to say today, but as a Scottish Government done any of its own work so far and what the financial consequences could be if you get it wrong? No, no, because it's, it's, it remains in our, in our assessment a hypothetical event. So no, there's not been any work done on that. And in fact, it would be a very complex area. That's why I referred early respectfully to what has been offered through the evidence. We might not agree that there are any costs, but at least we would do the service to the stakeholders of having a look at what they've said and to look at those opportunity costs. Um, as I say, perhaps you know, we, would, we would not agree that they're a reality, but we, 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 will, we will look through those. But no, no uh, specific tailored work on costs of that sort. Sure. Okay. But as, as we stated before, we have a, a, a full understanding of the financial implications of reclassification as raised in the session earlier because we have been through the college reclassification. So in almost every instance, the financial implications are the same. It is perhaps the size is magnified with universities. So whilst we haven't looked at the specific numbers, I would say we have a clear understanding of what those financial implications would be across the sector because of our experience looking at the college reclassification. I mean, the government are well versed at doing work like that, but I suppose it, 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 in case it sounds as if there's any dismissiveness, that work not being done is all based on the detailed risk assessment, and that's the point, I think, that, the, that, ha that it hangs on. Um, if we thought there had been a need to, then we would have, but the risk assessment suggests, suggests otherwise. Okay. And one very final question, then, just as a pure matter of detail. You're written to on the 13th of August. Um, you haven't responded yet. Um, it's six pages long, the letter, but you've done all the work. You've done a huge amount of analysis here. Just Roughly, when, would, when should University of Scotland expect to reply to that letter? As soon as possible. We're working on it now, and I wouldn't expect they would wait too much longer. And on the specific ONS point, I think I said earlier to an earlier question, the answer to that would be quite short, because my memory of the letter is they're looking for an absolute guarantee that reclassification 
wouldn't happen. So the answer would be compiled out of the, 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 the points about risk analysis and assessment that, that I've made today. Um, but the overall letter, uh, yeah, absolutely, as soon as we possibly can. I mean, we're halfway through, we're more than halfway, I expect, working through it. But there's no delay, uh, no purposeful delay. We will get that letter to them as soon as we possibly can. For, for, forgive me for pressing it, though, but I mean, are we talking days, weeks, or months? Oh, well, weeks at the most, weeks. certainly not months. Right. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Richard, to be followed by John. Thank you, Convener. You've made clear your view that ONS won't give you a categorical uh, um, opinion about whether um, the, these, um, the provisions would lead to reclassification or not. And I understand that, although I think Mr Brown's made the point well, it's worth asking him directly for their advice anyway. But given that the job of ONS will be to um, make interpretation in relation to European provisions on this in terms of European um, accounting system, would there be the potential for you to have dialogue at a European level or to approach you know, the, 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 those responsible for running that system about their view yeah. on the provisions here and whether that, that would risk reclassification? I think that, in my view, we, we have all we need at our disposal through the ESA guidance and Treasury's guidance on that and the chance to engage with Treasury who have experts whose you know, full-time job it is to advise on these issues. So I don't think there's the need in practical terms to, to um, invite a European conversation. But you to, could do, in th theoretically, do you believe? Well, the theoretically, we, we could open up a dialogue with, with, with any interested party, but mm -hmm. I think that we have at our disposal what we need to make the... Di well, we've already used it, what we have at our disposal in the written form. In fact, I have it here with me, the, the, the indicators of control. I mean, I'm guessing sort of puzzled that you've not sought any external advice at all, given the fact that you've acknowledged there's a risk, even if it's a low risk, and the fact that University of Scotland have made clear they've had legal <laughs> advice which says there's a significantly increased risk of reclassification. Mm -hmm. That, to me, would uh, make it quite clear that external advice would be a sensible thing to proceed with. Well, I mean, if University of Scotland want to share that advice, then we would happily consider it. Uh, but in terms of an external advice, our internal uh, assessment of risk, we felt, uh, is adequate. And uh, not... <laughs> I um, would wonder what external advice would offer w which would be different because in some ways this issue, risk assessment is not an exact science often and I suppose no. external advice might be open to opinion. We may find external advice which has a very negative opinion but we may, what, what, what worth would be exter external advice which seemed to be uh, lacking in objectivity and a pro-opinion. In some ways, I think that we've, we've looked at it in great level of detail and our opinion is that risk is not advanced. Yeah, the thing, you know, after the experience of Western Peripheral Route, which Mr Brown referred to, I think the Scottish Government would be wise to take a belt and braces uh, approach to this and to, to minimise any potential for, uh, for risk in this area and, and look to external advice. But I think the, the question I want to pursue now is, I mean, clearly, the, um, I understand from the evidence earlier, I mean, the chair of the review himself has said that the um, intentions of his review can be achieved without entertaining this possibility of a risk of reclassification, without proceeding with the provisions that should be put forward in the bar as it stands. You've talked about the potential to, if the risk was realised, to go back to the legislation and review it at that point. I mean, if the bill can be proceeded with, if the intentions review can be progressed without this risk being there at all, why wouldn't you make that, take that action now, prior to any problem um, bit arising, right. rather than having to address uh, events once legislation's in place and what could be yeah. a very difficult and, and, uh, yeah, and troublesome process? There's, there's quite a few layers in your question, and I'll try and, and, try and answer the whole question. I mean, I don't know exactly, because I've not read it yet, what Professor von Prandinsky said in his written submission to the, to the, the, the Education and Culture Committee. Committee. Having been in his company at a recent meeting, I know he remains uh, very, very supportive of the bill. I think that's fair to say. Now, he might be making a, a more technical point, yeah. and to link that to the point about secondary legislation, I think if there was any idea that modification, that I'm speaking, I'm ministers, obviously, I'm not a minister, I'm an official, but if there was any modification um, to secondary legislative powers which would not harm the bill's overall policy intention, then the Scottish Government would be open to that conversation. And if it in so doing minimises risk or the perception of risk, then that, that could be beneficial. On the question of when to do that, I think that the progress of the bill through parliamentary consideration would be the time to think about that. Because I, I'm perhaps taking wrongly from your question that you think that it might be left till after the bill was enacted. And then, be, you know, so I think in the process of the bill's uh, consideration, 
we would, you know, look, or the Scottish Government would look at the issue of the scope of those secondary powers? Yes, it, 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 is, it was suggested earlier on, I think, that you know, if reclassification actually did take place at that point, legislative changes would be considered. But, but I'm, I'm heartened to hear that what you're saying is that actually these matters will be considered before yeah. I mean, in, in, in the process of the bill. And, and you're open to that dialogue, and that's, yeah. that's certainly I mean, I think, it, helpful. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's not in my gift to say, to say what would happen, but it's certainly, given what's been said today, given what's been said in evidence, given the emphasis placed on these sections that are in secondary powers, Section 8 and so on, then it's entirely legitimate that everyone has a, has, a, has a joined up dialogue on that. So my final question, convener, is, you know, if the worst happens uh, and if this legislation does go through as is proposed at the moment and it, and it does, lead, in fact, lead to reclassification, I, mean, I think Kerry Twyman herself said that this has been a difficult process for colleges in terms of organising <laughs> the workarounds uh, for them in terms of, um, in terms of the, the reclassification issue. Uh, you know, would universities be compensated for the undoubted extra burdens which should be placed on them by having to deal with, mm. with the issues which, you know, creating those workarounds would, would, would actually create? I think, I think what, we've, what we've tried to make clear is that there was no expectation that if there was something that triggered a reclassification decision, and the way that it works is a reclassification decision would be triggered, that reclassification is not immediate. So in the case of the colleges in England and Wales, they were given a time period in which to review the control mechanisms and, and to make changes to keep them outside the boundary. So I think that's what we were saying. If, and it's a very low risk, and as we've said, it's a, it's a risk that we don't believe is changed by this legislation, I think that's a key point. It's a, ris a risk that already exists exists because of the nature of, of universities and their interaction with the Scottish Government. If there was to be a reclassification decision triggered by an ONS review that could well be triggered by a review of universities down south, which is the most likely scenario, we would then ask for a period to review the entire structure around universities to potentially make changes that would keep them out with that boundary. And I think, I mean, I think that's a, a helpful. Um, procedural explanation, but I suppose what we would want to reinforce is that our view of the risk is that it's very low. In fact, obviously in having a, a, a detailed conversation today, we, we know that there's, a, there's a, an existing base of risk, but it itself is low. I mean, some of these issues about um, reclassification have been raised in meetings 2012, 2011, and there is no, no work been taken forward. It's not as if we're dealing with a high risk base already. These risks are marginal and low. Now, that's not my assessment of, of the cuff. It's just the experience of the last four, five, six years. Obviously, in the realm of higher education governance, I've heard, obviously, the questions on um, that there's a bigger world of reclassification issues, but they're not necessarily all the same, but, of course, they, they, all, they all should be looked at and referenced to each other. So the question you asked though about recompense, I think that's a few too many hypotheticals ahead in a sense that we don't think there is a risk of reclassification spurred by the bill. So that's an issue which um, I take, take on board. If I've been asked a question on it, but I don't think that that's a likely uh, outcome given where we are today. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Uh, John, to be followed by Mark. Uh, thanks, convener. Uh, I mean, I suppose to carry on the, the present th theme, um, you've just said there's a very low risk you feel at the moment, leaving aside this bill of reclassification. The universities told us earlier on they thought we were in the kind of amber area of risk. Um, and then they, they said that from kind of maybe low amber, the bill would take us up to high amber or bright amber or something. Um, I, I suppose I'd have preferred numbers myself, but anyway, we'll go with the, we'll go with the colours. I mean, do you agree with their assessment of that? No, uh, but not, I mean, I, no, I mean, I, I respect their assessment, but I, I don't necessarily agree with it. I do agree with the colour they used first, though, that, that the impact would obviously be red. Yes. So that's not an impact anyone wants to happen. No. But I think the risk is assessed if we, we must have colours, then it's, it's more of a green hue. But I would not be dismissive of another's view on that, and we've got to take seriously what people feel strongly about. They've obviously expressed it today and, and in evidence. Right. But uh, the, the greater risk, w would you say that is, if, if there is a risk around cle uh, reclassification and accepting it's quite low, the greater risk would be in what's already the position rather than what this bill is doing. So if it had to be undone or redone or reorganised, it, it wouldn't be about this bill, it would be about the existing situation. I, mean, I, I, think, that's a, I think that's a fair, that's a fair point to make. The bill in itself um, does not add 
well, I, th I think, you know, I don't want to talk in absolutes about risk, but it doesn't add any risk or, or, or very, very negligible, but that, that's to be drawn in using words at all like that. It doesn't, it doesn't add risk. Um, as for the, the substance of the risk, I, I wouldn't want to over, uh, over amplify that either, actually. Um, can't be complacent, but it's, it's, not, it's not as if there's been great. I mean, no one has raised in dialogue the existing risk if, in recently, not in this debate, until now, until this point, until actually in the last, mm -hmm. possibly the last four to six weeks, as I say, there was no mention of ONS risk in the dialogue when the consultation was out, when Professor von Prandinsky's report and very thorough review was conducted, and a lot of these ideas were posited in that, that report. So it is, it's, it's, it's very heightened, and it has happened very recently. Thank you. Now, it's been suggested that we might go to some theoretical outside body to get a more definite ruling on reclassification and so on. I mean, I'm just interested if that such a, an, an organisation or body or individual actually exists, be that in Scotland or the UK. I mean, assuming, leaving aside ONS themselves, I mean, is there anybody we could go to? Because we could go to six lawyers and get six opinions, I would Very imagine. I, I, I would agree with that completely. I mean... We have spent a lot of time over the last year or two within the Scottish Government working on reclassification issues. Uh, there have been off-the-cuff remarks made that they consider the Scottish Government to be now one of the leading experts on reclassification because of the time that senior finance colleagues have spent around this and ministers themselves. Um, I don't know of any names that one would go to other than the Scottish Government Finance and, and the SFT, who, who we have spoken to, that would potentially be more experienced in this matter other than the ONS and Eurostat themselves and potentially Treasury. So I would agree with that assessment completely. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. I mean, the other suggestion has been a, that we write to the ONS. Now, I'd, I just wonder, given that this is a sensitive issue, would actually writing to the ONS increase the risk of them doing an investigation or even reclassifying? I mean, if I think I might have gone over the speed limit last night and I write to the police and say I did 31 miles an hour, do you want to check on it? That might not be the best thing to do. That, that, I think that's, that's fair, but it's probably what has informed the work right back on this, because I'd, I'd answered other questions about the internal versus the external nature of advice. Um, if, I mean, if governments of, a, of, of any, in, anywhere were to, to ask a body like that every time policy was taken forward, the, the, might, the answer might be along the lines of, well, I'll need to think about it for a good while before I get back to you, and then a determination will not be forthcoming until you show me exactly what you want to do. So um, I, I don't think that um, writing to, to, to ONS as part of the development would be, I mean, obviously you can break convention, but it w wasn't something that we, we thought was unnecessary, particularly based on the risk analysis that was a necessary action to take. And could it, uh, would there, there would be a slight risk that it would damage our case? Yes. Well, yes, yes. And it would certainly delay matters because the way they look at things is extremely excruciating detail based on, you know, it's not... It, 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 they, they, Sorry, they wouldn't, if we had written to them, the way the process is, we would not have received a response one way or the other, or we would have received a very on-stock response that said, we will not consider this until the legislation has gone through and the changes have been enacted. But as you said, it would have raised a flag. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, I mean, just one or two other points, kind of a different subject. Uh, I mean, delegated powers has been mentioned, I think, and I happen to be on the delegated powers committee. So... Is the fact that uh, that's been raised by the universities, is that something that maybe the government would look at uh, increasing the level of parliamentary input so that maybe where there's been a negative procedure, it might become an affirmative procedure, that kind of thing? Certainly, yeah, yes to that. But I think more fundamentally, it would seem that the, the content of those secondary powers would be looked at in light of the, the evidence to, to both committees as well. And, and what's been said today, I can't... Um, predict exactly what that would, would, would mean. But uh, yes, certainly, um, if concerns have been raised, we'll look thoroughly at the content, the impact, the, the intent, actually. As I said, I'd probably like to restate that the intent was to future-proof the legislation. Um, in some way, and I'm certainly not being dismissive of people's views of risk, but good housekeeping. There's no intent to advance ministerial control with those secondary powers. But given that the issues that have been raised, then I'm sure government will look at them. Mm -hmm. because 
I, I mean, it would certainly be perceived that if there was a negative procedure for some secondary powers, that would give the, the ministers a slightly more leeway than if it was an affirmative procedure. Yeah, I think, um, I think I'm right in saying that most of the, uh, if not all of the um, secondary powers which would give ministers the ability to change the legislation are all subject to the affirmative procedure. Okay. Uh, thanks. It, it, it was said earlier on that uh, it was not uh, the government's objective to, uh, for example, appoint somebody, a, a, an individual to a university governing body. I, I wonder if you could just clarify that. I mean, it wouldn't actually be, would it be possible for the government to appoint somebody? Um, I don't know in a point of law, but it would be completely undesirable. I mean, when uh, the word objective might have suggested there was some ambiguity. There is no ambiguity. The government would not, never want to directly put someone on any governing structure in a university, including ministers. And I know that there's been some concerns or views expressed that, but that is not the tension and, and, and wouldn't be. So it's putting a process in place. It's, it's just a process. It is, the, it is the how, not the who, never the who. And it is not giving the government the power to appoint an individual? No, in no way does the bill do that. In fact, nothing in the bill requires an HEI to ask government permission for anything. Okay, thank you. Um, Oscar made the point in their letter that there was a slight distinction between the four older universities and the more recent ones, uh, in that part one of the bill might become part of their constitution. Um, is, is, that, is that a concern or is that just technicality? I think Oscar go on uh, to develop their argument that although the constitutions would be altered by certain provisions in the bill, that it would not my word, not theirs, jeopardise their charitable status. That's their conclusion on that. OK, thank you. And my final point, um, I mean, the whole question of does the government get involved in the process of um, governing bodies being appointed, does that happen in other fields? Does, does government get involved in the process of people being appointed? Um, I, I, I wouldn't speak authoritatively on that, but they may do in public sector bodies, but universities are autonomous bodies, so they would never have any notion of being directly involved in the appointment process of individuals to governance structures. No, but actually putting the process in place with the, I mean, for example, for charities or outside organisations. Okay, it's maybe unfair to ask you. said before, there's a precedence in the sense yes. that the government can call for you know, proportion of, of a board to be of a certain nature and private companies even. So yes. I think that there is precedent. We couldn't give you, we're not experts on Sorry. the subject, so we couldn't give you examples, but there is defi definitely precedent. That's great. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you, Mark. <clears throat> well, I only had one question, convener, and the deputy convener has asked it. <laughs> so it wasn't about speeding, but um, <laughs> so no need, no need. Well, that's concluded questions from committee members. I've just got one or two wee points I want to raise just before we go, just because we haven't really touched on them, and it's specific to the financial memorandum as, 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 uh, as published. And um, it's, it's in relation to a couple of pieces of evidence that have been received. The first one is from um, the, uh, the um, Scotland's Rural College. And basically what they've suggested in terms of the issue of estimated costs and savings set in the FM and asking whether reasonable and accurate, They've said, and I quote, the experience of SRUC in relation to changing articles of association indicates that the assumption in the FM of the time and cost required to amend HIE's governing instruments is not accurate and that significantly understates the resource requirement both for the Scottish Government and for the institutions involved. So how did you come to the, uh, the assessment that you came of in terms of the costs of that? I think, I mean, Laura may have a perspective on this, but... I if I, if I understand the question correctly, I, I'm not sure that the financial memorandum actually specifies an analysis of the costs of updating uh, governing instruments in light of the bill's provisions. Um, because uh, the you know, updating governance as uh, part of the compliance with the Code of Conduct and, and many other decisions uh, HEIs want to make is, is part of mainstream business. Um, and any provisions that this bill would bring forward, should, should it be enacted, would be staggered in their implementation. Mm -hmm. So all institutions are different, they'll all have different numbers of staff, legal advisors, so it's really difficult to grasp on to any kind of standard estimation of cost. But I think, and, and if this is the item that they're homing in on, forgive me if I've misunderstood the question, mm -hmm. it would be a, a long-term activity. There might be a spike if, if, a, if a new bill becomes an act, but, um, we take what the SRUC say in, in their costs, but we, we, we found it very uh, challenging to identify any standard costs in this area and to package them up, given the staggered nature 
of the time it would take to change ordinances and, and, and governing instruments after the, the bill became an act. But if, I, if, if they're homing in on a slightly different issue, I apologise for giving the wrong answer. Uh, no, I think, I think your answer is actually fine. But I mean, what, another, from another um, organisation, the um, Queen Margaret University, they've said. Uh, we would ask the committee to note that the process of securing Privy Council and Scottish Government approval for a relatively straightforward amendment to the University's Order of Council to bring it into line with the Scottish Code is taking some 16 months. This process commenced in June 14. The amendment is due to commence in late um, September 2015. So basically what they're saying is that, you know, in terms of the changes that the bill would bring in, this would cause all sorts of uh, legal advice would have to be sought, administrative time, etc. And what they're saying is that this has not been accounted for either in terms of the financial memorandum. No, and I think I would probably um, point to the last, the last answer I made about the difficulty in, in isolating that for different organisations with different needs, different adjustments to be made to get standard costs. What I would say is, though, that in the consultation, reform to the Privy Council process was an item. Now, ministers decided not to take that forward in the bill um, for many reasons, but I would probably cite deep complexity in the historical arrangements about how we've arrived mm -hmm. at the current system, which has got... Some features which are regrettable about time taken and the, the detailed legal matters and the back and forth between legal advisers. But as part of the announcement about the bill, um, ministers did say that the Privy Council and a, a modernisation conversation, if you like, about that would commence uh, as a separate piece of work before any legislation was thought of in the future. So although it doesn't, doesn't directly relate to the issue of cost and time, there will be other activity to look at improving that to try and truncate these processes to actually save our uh, institutions money in the long run. Okay, thanks very much. That's uh, very helpful. Well, I'd like to thank you very much for your, for your uh, response to our questions. Is there any points uh, that you would like to make uh, further before we wind up? No. 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 Okay, well, thank you very much uh, for you. that. Um, this being the end of our, our public uh, sessions, I'll just have a a one minute, two minute recess to enable um, the official report uh, witnesses and members of the public to leave.